Okay, and I just wanted to highlight a few things about Gil. Okay, so first of all, I first met Gil at the HCSI meetings in uh, Palos Verdes. He was a um, frequent speaker and contributor to some of the workshops there. That was when Ian Woodward was still alive. Ian Woodward was a tremendous trader. He created, helped create the HCSI platform. I think Gil still uses the HCSI platform. Um, Gil used to work with William O'Neill, and um, so that's why you can see his, his books are trading like an O'Neill disciple in the trading cockpit with the O'Neill disciples. And the best book I've ever read on short selling is uh, short selling with the O'Neill disciples turn to the dark side of trading. Okay, so um, I also just wanted to highlight some of the other things that Gil is responsible for. So if you go on to Twitter, I think Gil is one of the more prolific tweeters on Twitter. Um, I think 45 doesn't tweet nearly as much as Gil does. <laughs> so, uh, and I, and most of the tweets that Gil posts are, are um, actionable and very um, profitable. And uh, I wish I could say the same for <laughs> other people that post on Twitter. But Gil's posts are, are to the point and very useful. So there's a lot of really good information here on, on how to trade. It shows you his entry points, and I'm sure you'll talk about that today. Um, he also has another website, The Virtue of Selfish Investing, which he um, works with Dr. Chris Kacher. Dr. Chris Kacher also was at the workshop that we went to in Las Vegas at Caesars Palace. So I just wanted to just tell two, two other stories before we get started here. The, the first one was that I was really excited when Gil was doing a workshop in Las Vegas. And we actually went out for dinner, and I think Gil was there, Chris was there, Fred Richards was there, my friend Jeff Scott from Florida was there, and I felt very fortunate to be in the presence of those luminaries. Um, so I don't know if it was the next day that we did the workshop, but um, while Gil was doing the workshop, um, Gil and Chris were short Apple. I think they were short 40,000 shares, and Apple had gone from $700 a share down to $500 a share. And I think as a consequence of uh, that trade, they were furiously trying to get out of their position, buy back their short sell on Apple. And I think it cost Gil a substantial amount of money. Now, I think he still did really well on that trade, but um, I think he resolved never to do weekday workshops again. So without too much further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Gil here. I'm surprised you remembered that, George. But now that you, you remind me, yeah, I remember watching the stock hit a low and then start to bounce furiously. And I, I couldn't get to uh, covering my position until later. So I mean, you know, what's a few hundred thousand dollars between friends, right? <laughs> so so we paid a very small amount for that workshop. You paid a very large amount for presenting it. And yeah, I suppose you could look at it that way. But, you know, I'm not out to make money on workshops, uh, <laughs> no, really. But, so. so I appreciate it. And, and again, we're going to have to um, do okay, a lot so of Okay, so I share, share my screen now and... How do I, how do I make sure I'm not bringing up my porno page? Oh, okay, here we go. How's that? You you guys see it now? Pacific Northwest Trading Workshop, April 24th. We got it. Okay, you like, you like that it. that blue color reminds me of the Vancouver Harbor, and uh, I just want to say I'm really excited to be back in Vancouver without actually being there. Although I probably would rather be there. It's probably my favorite, one of my favorite cities in the world. And if I were going to live anywhere else but Southern California, I would live in Vancouver. Um, in any case, what I want to talk about today is how this market is uh, its basically not your father's bull market. The market has changed. And I don't know if any of you have noticed, but things don't always seem as they appear to be. The, the old uh, triggers, you know, up on volume, 
you, you want to go piling in on the long side, down big on volume, you want to bail out or even go short. Breaking support levels are meaningful and, and will lead to further downside. Breaking out of bases means you're going to have a big glorious uptrend. You'll find that for the most part from a practical standpoint, and I have scores of examples which I'm going to show you today, these don't work the same way anymore. And so I've been wondering why this occurs and you can you can think about you know what what are the root causes you know who are the drivers in the market and whatnot but I think ultimately you just watch what happens on the charts and you begin to understand how the market really works now I know my old friends over at IBD will tell you that they understand how the market really works but in my view what they understand is how the market used to work it doesn't work the same way anymore so that's going to be the thrust of my presentation here for the next hour or so but I did read, I reread my little booklet, How to Make Effective Presentations, before I put this together. And the first thing it says is to develop rapport with your audience. So first of all, I'm imagining that I'm speaking to an, uh, an auditorium of about a thousand people. Please don't tell me anything else. I want to maintain that fantasy. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I'm going to move forward with, with building some rapport. So, the one thing you may not know is that there is a Gilmo BC connection, and it extends all the way back to 1992. When I first started as a broker at the venerable firm of Merrill Lynch, which has now been sucked up by Bank America, but I went to work for Be uh, Merrill Lynch in Beverly Hills for the simple reason that I knew that's where the money was. And I started cold calling, and I was able to meet people in the area. Century City is right next door. That's essentially the financial center for the entertainment industry where all the money is in LA. And we're getting more tech companies coming in, so it's broadening up, but that the entertainment industry is basically where all the money is. So as a broker, I furiously cold called, I, I made the um, executive club in my first year. And I got clients like River Phoenix and the comedian Dana Gould. He's also was a writer for many years for The Simpsons. And I've been a fan of The Simpsons since they first came out. I think they've been running now for 20 something years. And when I watch the show, I can often see da uh, Dana's sort of cynical uh, humor, humor style in the writing. And of course, actor River Phoenix was a big client. And at the time, I was actually going to center my business around catering to the financial needs of these big money clients. So, you know, the guy who's a broker for, for Bill Gates up in uh, the northwestern part of the U.S., he makes a lot of money scraping his 1% in fees off of Bill Gates' wealth, and so I envision myself doing the same thing. Now, River Phoenix is a very interesting client because if you had lunch with him, you never wanted to order a Diet Coke because he would sneer at you as if you were uh, holding some sort of toxic brew that was emanating toxic fumes that would get to him. Of course, as we all know, River Phoenix died of a speedball overdose on the sidewalk out in front of Johnny Depp's club in Hollywood, the Viper Club. I think some of you may remember that. And when River died, that put a, a big end to my idea of catering to these big uh, actors and taking fees from them. And it forced me to move into stocks, and that's where I started to focus. And of course, everything, uh, one thing led to another, and I got to where I am today. But these types of clients, they, as you know, Hollywood types, they're very left-wing, liberal, they're politically correct, and they're really into socially responsible investing. So one of the things I would do is research companies that were involved in socially responsible things like recycling or water purification and whatnot. And in my uh, searches, I came across a couple of Canadian companies. One was uh, Consolidated Enviro Waste. Anybody familiar with that one? Raise your hands because I can't see them. But uh, another one, I, I believe it's Caldera Water Resources. Anyways, my clients, they wanted to buy these stocks, and I think they traded on the Vancouver Stock Exchange at the time. And they were like $3 stocks. So we would go in and buy 20, 30, 40, 50,000 shares. And eventually, um, I got a call from the CEO of EnviroWaste, who just happened to be Doug Hallward. Now, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Doug Hallward, because as I understand, Canadians are to hockey what Liverpudlians are to soccer. And Doug Hallward, you notice here he's wearing an LA Kings uniform, uh, but he was apparently moved to the Canucks. And he was the CEO of this company. And so he called me up because I guess they noticed that I was buying large blocks of the stock. And they invited me to come up to Vancouver to visit. So I did that and visited their operations. I went to a VSE conference. 
And one night we went out to dinner, and Adam Oates, who played for the Boston Bruins, I think he might have even played for the Anaheim Ducks for a little while, was there at dinner, and he had been at a uh, trading card conference, and so he had his trading cards with him. Turns out that my father-in-law, my future father-in-law at the time, is French-Canadian and a huge hockey fan, grew up in Rhode Island, and he was a fan of uh, Adam Oates. <clears throat> and so I got several cards by, from Adam that he signed to uh, Mr. Lawrence, my future father-in-law. So I scored a lot of points with that. But we went out drinking with these guys, or I did, and I've never seen two human beings consume more alcohol in my life. <laughs> and we went around after, I mean, at dinner time, I mean, three, four martinis, and Doug was just quaffing them down. Then we go out bar hopping. And so we go to these bars, and we get to the first club, and there's this long line down the block. And I'm thinking, okay, we're going to sit in this line. And Adam says, no, we're just going to walk and go up front. So he walks right up to the front where the bouncer is, the guy controlling the doorman or whatever you call him. And the guy recognizes him and Doug right away, and they let him right in. And I'm coming in behind them, and the guy says, well, who's this guy? And Adam Oates turns around and says, oh, he's our new goalie. And they, so they let me in. And, uh, and so, that, so we spent the whole night doing that. A lot of clubs had lineups, you know, people trying to come in, and, and they just go right up in front. We'd go in. you go into the bar, and we'd be surrounded by women. So I nearly fainted from the smell of Canadian perfume. Uh, but, but these guys just kept drinking, and I just kept trying to keep up with them. And at some point, uh, I just remember waking up in my hotel room, and, uh, and it, I, I recall it as my one night in my life where I was a professional hockey player. Anyways, as the goalie. So anyways, uh, it was a very memorable trip. It was about a week long I spent in Vancouver, toured the whole area, you know, went up to, uh, I forget what the, uh, the parks up there are, Baden Powell or something like that. And uh, I, I met uh, the people at Caldera Waterworks, and I met the CEO at the presentation, and he invited me to his house. He was having a dinner party at his house, which was on the north side of the harbor up in the hills there. And so we went over there, and in his yard, I'm noticing beautiful view, but there's these plants over there in the corner. I'm looking at them, and uh, I realized they're marijuana plants. And so I asked him, what are those? And he says, oh, that's my BC bud. BC bud, okay, this is a new one to me, but, you know, he had all these pot plants growing. And so after dinner, they brought out silver trays with pot on them and rolling papers, and everybody was rolling joints and smoking them, and the CEO <laughs> comes by. You know, the CEO comes by with a big joint, and he's just toking away. And I was, like, marveling at this. It's like, what CEO in his right mind would do something like that, especially with a potential investor like myself who's representing these big clients who may want to buy 30, 40, 50,000 share blocks of his stock. And then more recently, I realized that this CEO is really not uh, a rebel. He was just ahead of his time. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. So Vancouver for me is a very cutting edge city, beautiful city. I really enjoyed it. I uh, look forward to going back once my son enters college next year and my wife and I plan to travel more and maybe the next workshop you have this will come up. So when I told my wife I was doing this, she said, oh, are we going to fly up for this? I said, no, I'm going to do it via webcast. She was very disappointed. But <laughs> anyway, so let's get back to the point of all this, which is that at one time I was an O'Neill disciple, and I hate this book title, How We Made 18,000% in the Stock Market. What did you say is How We Made 18,000% in the Stock Market 20 years ago. It doesn't matter, okay? To me, it's just marketing BS. I'm no longer an O'Neill disciple. I'm now an Owl disciple. And even though they've translated this book into Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, uh, I still don't really care much for the title. But I'm no longer an O'Neill disciple. I'm an Owl disciple. And that is I incorporate uh, O'Neill, Wyckoff, and Livermore into my way of looking at the market. So the first thing I was talking about earlier is that what are the drivers in the market today? I don't think that you have the same traditional drivers you had in the post-World War II period when you had the uh, family formation was increasing. You had all the veterans coming back from the war. They were going to work. They were getting good jobs. They were going to college. And basically, the investor class began to grow. And it reached a crescendo in the 90s when the baby boomers started investing for retirement. And so you, know, you saw the rise in mutual funds during that period. But since the financial crisis, it, that has all changed. And you can see on this chart here, you guys can see my pen. You see this line here. This is non-financial corporates 
are the big buyers of stock. Who is that? The Fed? Is it uh, high frequency trading funds, something like that? But you can see here, institutions, their buying has declined. Households has roughly been the same, and the rest of the world has roughly been the same as well. So the big driver here is something we don't really know what it is. It is a non-financial corporate. So I think back to when Livermore was around, Jesse Livermore, whom I'm sure you all know, in the early 1900s, what were the drivers in the market back then? Well, the trusts, the pools, there was a lot of manipulation going on. You know, things would not be the way they seem. They would try to drive out sellers and pick up their stock cheap and turn it higher. And what I've noticed is I, I didn't trade during that time. But if you go and you look at, I have a booklet. And back when I was at William O'Neill, just before I left, we had hired some PhD types, uh, business school students from UCLA during the summer to go into the libraries and pick up old copies of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times to get price and volume data on stocks from the late 1800s up until the O'Neill database was uh, initiated. And so we saw a lot of these patterns that, were, that occurred during the early 1900s, during the crash, the 1920s and 1930s. And so I'm familiar with some, the way some of these patterns work. And I noticed some similarities. So it's only a theory, but my thinking here is that we don't have the same drivers, and you need to understand that. And if you do, you can have more confidence in util utilizing these methods that I now use that actually seem almost contrarian. Well, they are very contrarian, but even more so, to a lot of people, they seem bizarre. So Wyckoff is a big... Uh, big influence on my thinking these days. But basically, the new market drivers behave differently. I think a lot of the trading is done by machines. I think there are a lot of sources that will tell you that the majority of trading is done by machines. And I think they tend to be contrarian beasts or reversion to the mean types of uh, programs. And I think their footprints are there to be seen. So what that brings into play is some mechanics that I think are bizarre at times. And so here's a chart of uh, Tableau software. Nice French-Canadian name, I guess. Uh, but you can see here, notice how you have a sharp breakdown here. You undercut the 50-day line, so it looks like it's breaking support, but it turns and rallies. And then it rallies back up during the highs, and it breaks down, and then rallies to a new high. So that's a breakout. O'Neill types would be buying it, and then you break down. So you take the escalator up, and you take the elevator down. Can you see my pen okay, George? Yes, perfect, yeah. Okay, beautiful. And then again, the same thing. You rally to new highs and you break down. Then you rally to new highs and you break down again. So you can see that, and I would note that over the last couple of months, a lot of these patterns that you're seeing are just choppy back and forth movements. There are some stocks and uptrends, but you're getting a lot of choppy randomness. But there is a certain order to it if you look at it carefully. I'll show you another name here. Here's Coupa Software. And this one actually just broke out on Friday through the 100 price level. But you can see here that you run into three breakout. There's one breakout attempt, it fails. Second breakout attempt, it fails. Third breakout attempt, it fails. But each time, it finds support near the 65-day exponential moving average. And I've actually found that the 65-day exponential moving average is now a moving average that I want to have on my charts all the time. The old wisdom is that the 50-day line is where support is, and that's what O'Neill taught. But I think the machines know this. And so what happens is they shake things out below moving averages, but you, you'll get another support level at the 65-day exponential. I've heard other people say, oh, the 63-day simple, whatever. But if you observe it and you play around with moving averages, you'll observe this, okay? So it's all about how typical market research is done. You observe occurrences, and you develop a sample size. And if you have a statistically significant sample size, not just – Three examples, you know, like O'Neill does with the high tight flag formation. I think they go in the last book, they go all the way back to the early 1900s up to the present. They come up with 13 examples of a high tight flag, and they believe that that is statistically significant. It is not. But I can show you hundreds of examples of the way the market works today. So let's progress. You get a lot of weird movement. Did anybody notice the action? Uh, on Thursday, the market broke down hard in the middle of the day, in the morning, uh, actually, rather. Uh, it was rallying, and it, it gapped up and ran up a little bit. This is a five-minute chart. And then it looked like it was coming a little bit. Then it looked like it was heading back. And all of a sudden, it just breaks real hard. And then it spends the rest of the day 
trundling back up to the highs. And you see a lot of this action. I don't know if anybody's noticed that. Even on Friday, we had a sharp breakdown. I was watching the NASDAQ 100 because I was actually long the SKUs, SQQQ. And I, I think it was started, the, the futures actually started up about 45 points or so, and I was actually buying the SQQQ in the pre-open. And then as we progressed into the opening, within the first half hour, hour, the market broke down. The NASDAQ 100 was down about 65 points. So it's about a 40, uh, let's see, 45 pre-open and 60, so about a 110-point round trip off the highs. And, and then the, for the rest of the day, the market slowly marches back to the uh, unchanged line. And I ask myself, who's doing that? You know, and, and once you see a break like this, and it occurs on volume, and you see a bunch of stocks break with it, and then you start edging higher, your main concern is that you're going to do this. You're going to roll over. But instead what happens is it slowly chops its way higher. And I would urge you to you know, observe the market during, uh, during the trading day. And you'll see this sort of thing happen. It also occurs with stocks. And so to me, do humans do that or do machines do it? So the way to uh, solve the problem to me was to forget about O'Neill as a sole source of methodology and focus more on the portions of Wyckoff's and Livermore's thinking that O'Neill ignored. Because O'Neill, his system was developed during the post-World War II era where mutual funds were the drivers and there was this consistent pattern of institutional and household accumulation of stocks. Because if you look at the statistics, you had very few uh, households owning stocks, say, in the 1980s, and by the time you got into early 2000s, there was a very high proportion of households owning stocks. Now, that has dropped off because people have had some pretty bad experiences with the crash in 2000 and then in 2008. So as I said before, I'm no longer an O'Neill disciple. I'm an Owl disciple. So in the title of my new book, which I'm writing right now, will probably self-publish on Kindle Direct Publishing so I can make a 70% royalty instead of a 6% royalty. Uh, <laughs> we'll feature this and these setups, which I refer to as ugly duckling setups. And this is a picture of the ugly duckling. He's actually, he looks like he's a stoner, but he's actually heavily into scotch, okay? <laughs> so he raids bird feeders where people put scotch in them. And then you have my, my little character uh, from my old doopy strip. If you go on to Amazon.com and search for me as an author, you will not only find four books that I either co-wrote or authored about the financial markets, you will also find a couple of books that I wrote that are cartoon collections. So I was once a cartoonist, and now I'm a trader. It makes perfect sense especially these days. But anyways, the ugly duckling is just a term I've coined uh, to refer to all these, these patterns that when things look their ugliest, a lot of times they're ready to t turn around and take off to the upside, which is what the ugly duckling is here with its little rocket pack made by SpaceX. But uh, that's the gist of it. So probably my favorite setup, and one that is highly effective, and I think you can use it. It's very simple. There's nothing complicated about it. You don't need to have MACD lines and Bollinger Bands and whatnot doing anything. All you need is to identify a prior low in a pattern. And this is a typical Wyckoff type of spring formation. So here's the Wyckoff chart. So here's, this is the undercut of the prior lows. So you have these lows and it's been coming down and sometimes it maybe have been coming up, whatever. But you undercut these lows and that is a spring. And what happens is you use the low here if I clean this up just a pinch, you take the prior lows in the pattern. Those become your long triggers. So when this happens, your entry point is this low. So whatever the price is, that's your entry point. And then you can give it a couple of percent of porosity on the downside. Porosity meaning dropping below that low, you know, percent or two. And that's where you would set your stop. In this manner, you keep your stops very minimal. One, two, three percent. My own way of operating is when I see an undercut and rally, I come in on the uh, breach or, or the break back up through the prior low and I use it as my stop. Now if it drops back below, I sell, sell out my position immediately. But if it regains that either on the same day or on subsequent days, I'll come back in. So it may require some persistence. The very best ones work very quickly though and you'll get some uh, very rapid upside uh, movement and they're, they're basically high time value trades. So in other words, a lot of upside price movement in a short amount of time. And to do this, you need to have a lot of intraday buying power because you may have to come back in, a, in and out of a stock two or three times. But in any case, that's the essence of an undercut and rally uh, 
long setup, okay? And it's occurring when people think that it's breaking support. And sometimes you may even have the 50-day moving average or something else along these lows. Now, the other thing I notice, and using this chart to its uh, fullest here, is that a breakout, it generally does this. It runs up a little bit, and then it comes in. But the difference here is Wyckoff shows this in this example is coming back to the top of the prior base. A lot of times what they do is this. They drop back into the base. Sometimes they even drop back below the other low, and then they do this. Okay, so that's another thing I call a re-breakout. And <clears throat> that's something I will watch for. And a lot of times it will coincide with a pullback uh, into a moving average, say, in the base. So let's clean this up again. And you may, let's say you have a 20-day exponential moving average in here, which on my charts is actually green on the charts that I'm going to show you. So you may fail on the breakout and then bounce off, say, it's 20-day exponential. That's actually my favorite moving average to buy on pullbacks when a breakout fails. And I'll show you some examples of that in just a second. And that's the essence of how I approach the markets. When things look like they're failing or breaking support, I use an undercut and rally as a uh, long entry when everybody else wants to sell out. And I do not buy breakouts, but I watch for a subsequent failure of the breakout that may set up a new buy point. Now, to anybody who's schooled in traditional technical analysis or even O'Neill methods, this all seems bizarre and kind of stupid, but it's not. Anyways, let's look at an example here. Whoops. I don't know what I did there. So what we look at here, this is uh, Tencent uh, Music Entertainment, Chinese name. And this is one that we played recently. For anybody who reads my reports, uh, we were talking about it back in January. And here's a low here in the formation. Here's where it undercuts that low. So now this low here becomes your entry point. Two days later, you're running up through it, and you're buying in there. Now notice how here's a breakout. It runs up, but now it pulls back, and it actually fails on the breakout. But again, what does it do? Here's another low here. You undercut that low and you rally back above it. You also have the 20-day exponential as a reference for support. So if you take the trade here, you can use this low or you can use the 20-day exponential. See how simple that is? And you don't have to worry about volume. That's really not a factor. It's price movement. I mean, in the old days, they used to talk about, and I know a lot of futures traders will uh, advocate this as well as currency traders, that I know that price is everything, volume is really nothing and not to really pay attention to it. And I find that's more the case these days when uh, you're looking at stock charts. So you, you see you have one undercut and rally here and a second one here. And this one leads to better upside. It actually holds above this little range here, so that's holding up nicely. Then you run up and you have another one where it pulls in. Now at this point, you may have established a position here and here. And once you're up here, you're really not interested in buying too much because I don't average up like I used to. In the old days, if I bought something, I was usually buying when it was up big on volume, and then it was up a little more, I'd add more, and i add more. What I find myself doing now is as if I take a bigger position on the undercut and rally here, okay, because I can keep my risk to a minimum by using this prior low as my stop. So, you know, if you're going to take a 20% per percent position and use a 7% stop, like O'Neill says, well, that's going to hit you for one-fifth of that. So what is that? You know, one in, well, how's my math? Either? Like 1.4% total damage to your portfolio. Okay, if you take a 50% position here, but you only use a, a 0 to 1% stop, now you've uh, kept your, your risk actually lower than buying a breakout and using a 6 7 8% stop. So take a big position on the undercut and rally. If it doesn't work, just bail out. But when they, when they do work, you'll, you'll notice they do work pretty well. And that's another uh, earmark of these, is that when they do work, they do work pretty well. And if they don't, then maybe you're getting a sense that the stock is struggling a little bit. But as it moves higher, I'll find myself peeling the position back rather than averaging up. Seems kind of strange, but that is what happens. And then finally, you get this breakout, okay? And what happens? That fails. So there's another breakout that really goes nowhere. But notice how you undercut this low here, and you rally back above it. You take a few days to get going, you're back up at the highs. So again, you have several undercut and rally setups in this pattern, and those are your buy points, okay? Not the breakouts. I think if you chase breakouts these days, you're a moron, okay? Pardon my French. How do you say it in French, anyways? Moron, moron. Anyways. Um,
Here's another one. This is more recent, Zscaler. Okay, here, first of all, here's down big on volume. In this market, down big on volume is a buy signal because you can also couple this up with this low here. It undercuts this low and rallies above it here, and then you get a little trade out of it, but then it breaks down again through this low and bounces off the 50-day line. Now, this is a, another favorite setup. If I can get an undercut and rally move that coincides with a bounce off a moving average, now I've got two references for support, and I can keep my risk to a minimum. And I think in this market, it's all about trying to take bigger positions at potential inflection points back to the upside and keeping your risk to a bare minimum rather than this business of, oh, 6%. You know, I think that's for the slow animals in the herd. I'm sure you're all nodding in agreement. Uh, Gil, but now you're back just above. Ask what moving averages you have on your chart. Oh yes, that's probably. I used to when I did the HCSI conference uh, presentations. You, I used to have knew. a little thing on it. Yeah, I, I basically have a blue 50-day simple, a red 200-day simple, a green 20-day exponential, and a magenta 10-day simple. Okay. So on some charts, you'll see a black 65-day exponential moving average, but I'm trying to keep my screen a little bit clean here because it can get messy, you know. Draw enough moving averages on your chart and you'll have support and resistance everywhere. Stock won't be able to move without running into one. So you can get carried away with moving averages, but I do find the 65-day exponential moving average to be relevant for certain stocks. And you'll, you'll see this on the charts. You'll see that there are certain stocks that tend to find support at the 65-day exponential moving average. Coupa is one of those that I've observed to do that. And I don't know why that happens. It just does. But I needn't uh, wonder why my, my task is just to do or die, right? So now uh, Zscale, you had an undercut and rally. And this, this was, I think, at 61.39 here. Actually, I think it's this day that's the low. So you triggered on this day on the bounce off the 50-day line. Now you're back up a good 10%, roughly, up back to these highs and hanging along the 20-day line. And on Friday, it settled in to the 20-day line, so it's still remaining in a viable position. But again, there's the undercut and rally at work. Now, back in January, uh, Roku was a stock I was looking at. I, I played this one on the upside here. For those of you who read my reports, uh, you had a pocket pivot here, and then you had voodoo action when the volume dried up in here along the 20-day line. So if I see a pocket pivot coming off the bottom, a bottom fishing pocket pivot, you know, it's not up here. I'm buying it down along the lows. And you get, it back, but you get it back above the 50-day line, and then I see a pullback into the line with voodoo volume in here. And that's very light volume of minus 35% below average or lower. And I'll take a position there and you use the 50-day line as your stop. This one worked very well, and you had a Bible gap up here and it continued higher, and it finally broke down. And then it broke down with the market in October into late December. And if you recall, you know, up here you got all these idiots on financial cable TV, CNBC, Fox Business News. You know, oh, the market's wonderful. It's the Trump rally. Everything's going higher. They're all babbling, but nobody tells you to sell ever. Of course, when the market's down big, they tell you that it's a buying opportunity. But all I want to know is how can it be a buying opportunity to take advantage of if you never sell anything and have cash to buy things with? So, you know, there is a point. For me, this is a short at the 20-day line. It was a pod, punch bowl of death type short. That's another issue altogether. But what happened is you broke down very rapidly. I think that was 11 weeks. And you undercut this major low. So this is a different type of an undercut and rally. This is what I call a macro undercut and rally. And it coincides with two things. And that is the first one is that the stock has a severe breakdown. And in the process, it undercuts a low of several months prior. So that's what you saw here. At the same time, the general market hits a low. And it turns. And usually, you know, that's when all these morons on financial cable TV, and I hope that my use of the term moron uh, doesn't offend anyone, but it is my favorite term uh, to denigrate people with. <laughs> In any case, uh, all these guys, you know, all these guys who said, oh, you got to buy. Oh, you got to buy the pullback here. you got to buy the pullback. you got to buy the pullback. Now, now I remember I, I see these guys. And I watch CNBC and Fox Business News more as a form of entertainment, but also as a contrarian sort of thing. Because at this point, all these guys who were telling you to buy all the way down, suddenly they were concerned. They didn't tell you to sell anything, but they were concerned. And I can see that everything is getting oversold. And I'm not only am I seeing Roku undercutting a major low, I'm seeing stocks like Netflix and Apple doing almost the exact same thing, Facebook as well. And the market turned, and if you read my report at the time, I called this a buy at 29.30. Then you had a, a bottom fishing viable gap up here, and then boom, you're off to the races. 
So this is a different type of an undercut and rally, and it's one to watch for when the market has been correcting severely. And it's just about the time that all the, the pundits on financial cable TV will tell you that we have now entered bear market territory. So I don't know what the heck that means, because by the time something has entered bear market territory, it's already down big. So you're not telling me anything I can't already see. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Anyway, here's the weekly chart. I should have my graphic of Captain Obvious up here, shouldn't I? Uh, but you can go on my Twitter page and find it. But you can see it also on the weekly chart. Okay, so this is the original failed cup with handle, and th that was a great chart. But you can also see the 11 weeks down. I think this is like roughly the same number of weeks up, 10, 11, yeah. So this was 1, 2, 5, 12 weeks down and 11 weeks up, and now it started to fail. But you can see how this worked out. And this is a macro undercut and rally. And I'll tell you a secret that Bill O'Neill used to use stuff like this. He never talked about it in his books or his uh, workshops or seminars or tapes or videos or whatever else he put out there. But this was actually one setup that he would watch for. Um, so, you know, I had this in my quiver a long time ago, and most people thought Bill was nuts when he would talk about this, so he didn't really talk about it. But it is a Wyckoff, Livermore type of thing. Um, the shakeout plus three is Livermore's rule, which is like an undercut and rally, only I don't need to sit there and count points. You know, did it shake out through this low and go three points above? Then I buy. No, you just buy it at the point of impact. So this low, whoops, this low is 29. So once it comes up above 29, boom, you're in. And then here's Apple. And the same thing was going on with Apple. You were undercutting all these lows in the pattern. And once it, it starts driving back above, you can actually come in and buy it. And do you know that if the market turns, managers who bailed out of Apple, uh, some of them will be piling back into Apple because you're really not going to get fired if you have a big position in Apple. Remember that a lot of institutional managers, I don't know how the machines work, but I'm sure the machines are looking at this from a contrarian point of view and viewing this as a breach of, of um, support and that they'll just come in and buy. So you, it's a reversion to the mean type of thing. So I mean, I know a little bit about this because I have friends who work on these things and but I, don't, I couldn't tell you what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but I don't think I need to. I think we can theorize about things, and then you create a theory, and that is, I already expounded on that, uh, that it's a largely a machine-driven contrarian type of market, and you, you want to be buying at the inflection points at the bottom and selling perhaps at the uh, inflection points at the top. So you can have a theory that, okay, maybe this is machine-driven, it's contrarian because it's reversion to the mean type stuff or similar to that. And then you can observe occurrences that prove the theory, you know, at least to the point where I can create a practical system to capitalize on that. You know, I'd, I'd rather run with the algos than run against them, let me tell you. Because you, you know they're, they're pretty incorrigible. When they start buying... They start buying. They flip the switch, and it doesn't let up. We had that the other day after, I forget who uh, reported earnings. Um, was that Monday when we had a big rally? The, the NASDAQ was up 100 points or something like that. Anyways, here's another instance of this in Netflix. So Netflix has come down. And I, I remember right around here, the guys on financial cable TV, they're shorting the stock, and they're confident about, you know, this is it for Netflix. Well, it wasn't. And Netflix is trying to break out now. So, And there's the macro undercut and rally. And you'll also see it on the daily charts. You can fine-tune your entries here. But I think, for the most part, uh, it works. And, and uh, you can keep your risk to a much uh, bare minimum than you can buying a breakout and using a 7 to 8% stop uh, and then getting whacked immediately. Uh, and in this case, again, the metho methodology is you take a bigger position than you might normally on a breakout but you're keeping your risk that much tighter so that your net loss to your portfolio is going to work out to something less than you would have if you had a failed breakout. Now, here's the NASDAQ currently. And we went up a little further, I think, on uh, Friday. I did all these charts on Thursday. But you can see at this point, you know, you've had, I would call this one, two, and three waves to the downside. So if we look at a weekly chart, that's probably what that would look like. And once you've got through as on the downside, you're looking for a rally. So, I mean, uh, the rally admittedly has been very surprising, but it's there, and there are ways to play it. Now, it's not that even among all stocks, and I think if you're buying strength, you're more susceptible to getting whacked than if you're trying to buy weakness and keep your risk tight. And that's an overall strategy that I employ in this market, and I call it an opportunistic strategy. 
I'm opportunistic. When the market's down, my antenna go up, I'm looking for stuff to buy, possibly on undercut and rally moves. So other types of undercut and rallies, we looked at a, a, an undercut and rally on a daily chart. We looked at a macro undercut and rally on a weekly chart. Now we're going to look at an undercut and rally on moving average. There's another trick that I use. When you have something that's trending steadily, and that's you, you'll get these breakdowns through moving averages like this. And probably if, if I had a 65-day 65, 65 exponential moving average up here, it would probably run along here. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. And I find that these undercuts of the 50-day line, notice that this is actually a technical violation, according to Dr. Catcher's. It's actually Catcher, not Catcher, George, just so you know, for future reference. Uh, catcher. Yeah, he gets, he'll get offended if you say Catcher, just so you know. Uh, but anyways, you see these undercut and rally moves uh, through the moving average. And again, when I see something coincide with an undercut and rally here, so you have one here, as it breaks the 50-day line on this day, it actually ends the day here, and it rallies above this low. So you've got both the price undercut and rally and a moving average undercut and rally. So to me, that adds weight. And notice how on the pullbacks here, when you get up there, you're holding along the 20-day line, not the 10-day line. So the 20-day exponential is a key moving average. And on some of my charts, I will have a 20-day exponential daily moving average, a 20-day simple, a 19-day simple, and a 22-day simple all on the same chart. And it be, it, what it does is it creates a zone of support. And you'll find that if it flips through the 20-day briefly, you may find that it uh, it helps support at the 20-day 20 22 day simple. I mean, I know Ron Brown and the guys over at HGSI. I think, Ron, what does he use, George? Like a, a 22 or a 19? I forget. It's not a 21? 21, maybe. Yeah, that's it. So, but I put all these on charts. You know, I look at charts. I mean, to me, charts are like porn. You know, I, I look at them all the time, <clears throat> even in the bathroom. But I won't get into any more details than that. Um, but I mean, looking at a lot of charts to me is is how you pick up patterns. You know, and you see the changes in the market. I think people who just want to read a book or have someone spoon feed them are not doing it the right way. It's it's certainly not as much fun. And and in all my work in my website, see one thing you you won't see on my website, either one of them, you won't see some some uh, testimonial. You know, I subscribed three days ago, and my first trade, I made ten hundred thousand dollars. You know, um, I think that's all BS. Or people who get up there, you know, oh, I was the investment champion, the U.S. investing champion, twenty five years ago. Okay. You know, and you can emulate my performance. And I'm going to tell you all right now, you can't emulate my performance. I could tell you, you know, I'm up 72% this year, blah, blah, blah. I was up 110% last year. But that's, to me, misleading because you have to be a maniac to do that in this market. You have to take big positions and be able to, to withstand volatility of 20 to 30% drawdowns, which is what I will have with some regularity. And when I tried to run a hedge fund and that happened, which to me was a normal sort of thing. The clients would freak out. So I couldn't, I couldn't run hedge funds, and I had to give that up. But I much prefer running my own money because I don't care if I drop 20 30% if it's all in the service of trying to throw up some big numbers. But I don't think that other people can necessarily emulate that because we all have to trade according to our own psychology, and you have to determine you know, what is your psychological limit when it comes to risk tolerance. How much can you you know, watch your account drop without, you know, having having a nervous breakdown. And also, you know, are you rich or, or are you poor? Are you starting with a little bit of money? How much capital can you really afford to lose? So there's also a material limit in terms of risk as well. But anyways, I think this method ultimately limits your risk in this market and allows you to capitalize on some pretty high velocity moves. Now let's look at the the Apple undercut rally here. This is the one that occurred uh, on the macro chart, the weekly chart that I showed. And you also notice it occurred at the same time as you had a gap down. Now look at this, gap down on big volume. Now traditionally, you don't want to be anywhere near that on the long side, right? But guess what? It's a buy signal. And the, market, the stock turns around, it undercuts this prior low here, and it trucks on back to the upside. And on the way up, you get an undercut of the 200-day moving average. And I remember seeing this, and the volume's heavy, you know, and Everybody's so, oh, it looks like Apple's at the end of the line for Apple. And I thought to myself, well, if it gets back above the 200-day moving average, that's a moving average undercut and rally. It fakes everyone out. The volume's heavy. But I think what you have is profit-taking after this move. So you also have to think in terms of if the machines are doing the trading, at what point might they 
take a reversion to the mean type stance and sell some stock to bag some profits if they were buying down here on a reversion to the mean buy, you know. So you kind of have to think like an algo. That may be the title of my next book. Um, I'm sort of torn. Maybe I'll, I'll take a poll on that. But uh, you can see there's no real volume here as it comes up, but it keeps trundling higher. They got earnings, I think, on Tuesday, so we'll see what happens there. But again, that's the sort of thing to look for, the fake out. Now, if we go back and look at what happened, and look at this chart, and we look at uh, what happened in October, November, when the market started to break, then you're going to notice here, here's an undercut and a rally, and it failed, okay, because you broke down again. Now, you can say, oh, well, if I had bought that, you know, what would I be doing? Well, you'd probably be bailing out very quickly if it fails. And another thing that you want to watch for in this current market environment is the indexes are at all-time highs. The NASDAQ hit an all-time high. The S&P at all-time closing high on Friday. The Dow is a little bit behind the two, but it's within 2% of its all-time high. And you, you have to be on the lookout for one thing that will tell you that we may be looking at a change in the direction of the tide, and that is that undercut and rallies will suddenly stop working. And that's what happened in October, November. And uh, you can go back to my reports at the time, but I could see other signs at the time that, that basically there wasn't a lot of things that I was looking at buying. Most stocks were extended. There were some stocks that were starting to break down. Now, we're seeing some of that now. Notice Intel, 3M, Caterpillar this past week. Those are major marquee names, or as my cohort Kevin Martyr likes to say, the glamours. <laughs> I don't know, I think they're, it makes them sound like runway models, but he likes to use that term. I call them big stocks or marquee names. And you'll, you'll start to see some of that happening. You're seeing that now. And I also noticed on Friday we had Hershey the last few days. Hershey's been running, Service Master, which is funeral services, and I tweeted humorously, I hope. Uh, you know, people are just dying to buy that one. Uh, also, PepsiCo was rallying. And these are defensive names. Now, I don't know if we're in an environment where you're, you just have all this money out there because all the central banks are printing money, and they're all backing up. They, they think they're going to tighten. The Fed has done the same thing. They went from hawkish to immediately dovish and then even more dovish. You look at Mario Draghi, who looks like a fool every time he goes up there, and you know they're talking now about backing up rates as well. And uh, I think, what's RBC doing these days? Are they, have they been lowering rates, George? Um, no, not yet. Yeah. No, been talking so, about it, but not yet. But I mean, fiscally, Canada is one of the more sound countries in the world. So, anyways, uh, but you know, everybody's printing. Bank of Japan, China's been, you know, throwing in stimulus, monetary stimulus, and so everybody's printing. So you got all this money out there sloshing around, and I just wonder, is money just going into these stocks just because? And you see names like, uh, you know, the rails are all breaking out. So. And, and I look at these things, and you know, Union Pacific, I think 2% earnings growth or something like that, and I don't understand you know, how rails, I remember in the old days, and I, I don't know, George, you, you may be younger than I am, but I remember in the 1990s, rails sold at six, seven, eight times earnings, you know, and now they're at 21, 22, 25 times earnings. Caterpillar, same thing, but Caterpillar got hit this week. So I'm seeing some signs that tell me there may be some issues. Now, here's, uh, here's another one, another example. And you have the undercut and rally through this low here, and it continues higher. And then what do you notice? It breaks out, right? And a nice breakout, punches through the 200-day line, but then the breakout fails. So if you bought the breakout, which you'll notice also did not occur on any volume. This one did, but didn't really quite clear it. And then you bounce uh, to the downside, or inflect to the downside, I should say. And you break below the 200-day moving average, and you break below the 50-day moving average. But what you're looking at here is a moving average undercut and rally. So this looks bearish. It's a failed breakout, but what do you get? You get a re-breakout. So that's the other setup that I'll look for. And usually it starts with some sort of coherent and very concrete, ugly duckling setup. You know, I know that picture, that cartoon I drew of the ugly duckling doesn't make him look very coherent, but the setups actually are very coherent. Risk can be managed very tightly. And they work. And I can show you example after example. So and if we have time, I may just run through my current long watch list, which is about 90, I don't know, 95 names or something like that. Uh, and you're going to see a lot of this type of stuff. So again, how do you understand what the market's doing? You look at a lot of charts. You develop large sample sizes. Do they corroborate with your theory? If so, what are the exact methods to use, the mechanics that you're going to use to capitalize 
on the confirmation of your theory. And that's what this is all about. That's what the ugly duckling setups are all about. That's what the undercut and rally setup is all about. And it, and the beauty of it is it's very simple. So so simple, even a caveman can do it. So anyways, let's look at some more. Viva Systems. It likes to slip out below the 20-day line, but you might notice here, through this low, there's an undercut and rally there. Just want to look at the big volume selling. And then it just comes out and heads out again. Notice how it breaks out, but it fails and undercuts the 10-day line, which isn't meaningful, but again, it finds support along the 20-day line. Here you undercut the 20-day line, then you push higher. But you're seeing the same sort of moves. And it, you know, forget about what kind of upside you get. Generally, you get pretty decent upside off of these UNR or undercut and rally. I call them UNRs, so I'll just refer to them as UNRs. Um, but you see here, it works. You know, and you just see example after example of these. Whoops, that was my, uh, George already showed these, but uh, you notice I kicked Kevin off here. Kevin's actually doing his own website now, but let's go through, let's look at some charts. What do you say? So let's look at something like, uh, not Chipotle, but I'm going to go, let's pull up my, uh, uh, where did it go? There we go. Let's look at my buy list. And... Why did that not change? Now let's go back. I'll go over here. Looks like my, oh, here we go. All right, so let's. Hmm, let's do this. Something happened here. A is for Apple. So that's the first one, and we already gone through this example. But let's look at Aurora Cannabis. Okay, you guys, it's a Canadian company. Uh, I think Canadians are smart for legalizing cannabis. I think, you know, in the U.S., the federal government's still in denial, but at least the states are getting a clue. You know, it's out there. It's always been out there. Uh, I can remember when I was 12, 13 years old, we used to be able to get what were called nickel bags and dime bags, if anybody <laughs> remembers that. But you can see here, here's a breakout, and... Uh, Here's a 65-day exponential, and you find support along it. And it's the same situation. Here's another breakout here, and you find support at the 20-day line. There aren't any real undercut and rally moves in here, but Aurora Cannabis, other than having the undercut and rally here back at the end of December, and if you read my reports back then, I actually did pick this up. Aurora Cannabis, uh, Canopy Growth, these were all doing the same thing. And you, it started with an undercut and rally move, and it was a little bit slow, and then boom, you had some nice movement there. And then you pull back into the 20-day line, your volume dries up, and that's where you want to be entering. So again, that's an opportunistic entry. So the 20-day exponential, and like I said, you can create a zone of 20-day support using various moving averages that approximate that, you know, 19-day, 21-day, 22-day, whatever. But it's roughly, that's pretty much the idea right there. And, uh, and also, I notice in some cases, the 65-day exponential does come into play. But let's just continue. I'm just going to, this is my sample size. Acacia, <coughs> here's an undercut and rally through the 200-day line. But you'll notice here you had an uh, undercut and rally move here. You undercut this low and then rally back above it. So you get another entry right here. And you have the 20-day line uh, providing additional support. You have a breakout here, but what does it do? It fails. <laughs> And you'll see this happen with such regularity. So that's another example where you have the undercut and rally working as an entry signal. And you have a moving average undercut and rally in there as well. Now, last weekend in my video report, I do video reports, which uh, I have a good time with. But I noticed uh, it was a week before last that they knocked all the medical names. Everybody see that? I mean, you had every medical name, medical-related, biotech, medical device, health care. They all got smacked all together. And you can look at the IBB, for example, and it looks similar to that. But what I noticed is that there are a number of names that were acting well until that happened, and they're all undercutting prior lows. So actually, my video report, which would have been after this day, I said these are undercut and rally moves in this one, and it's good for trade, and uh, it's worked. So again, there you have it, once again. And it coincides with support at the 200-day simple moving average. We've talked about applied material. Um, Amberell, that's another one altogether. But again, here we have Advanced Micro. They're going to be reporting Tuesday after the close. But here's a low here. Now notice how you have the breakout. 
Okay, there's a breakout. It fails. You get a re-breakout. It fails. Okay, so if you're buying this thing on breakouts, you're just a glutton for punishment. But if you're opportunistic and when everybody's screaming and the thing is down here, you will notice that the day after you have these lows in here, you get an undercut and rally long setup right there. You go along the stock. This becomes your stop. It pauses briefly along the 20-day line. And I would also point out that a common setup you'll also see that comes after an undercut and rally is where a stock will then settle in along the 10-day and the 20-day moving averages and volume will dry up as it does here and it will continue higher. And then notice how you get another breakout. It runs up a little bit and then it fails and it drops below the breakout point. But where do we get support at the 20-day exponential moving average? And AMD tends to obey the 20-day exponential moving average. We'll see what it does after earnings. And I'm going to assume that they're gaining some market share from Intel in the processor business. Uh, a lot more people are using their chips in uh, for the cloud and for servers. So they may it may be a favorable uh, number, but we'll see. But I'm not going to buy it and hold it through earnings if I don't have a profit. So anybody who owns Xilinx found out what that gets you. Anyways. Ariston Networks is uh, just one that ten, tends to obey the 20-day uh, line, but I'm just going to cruise through these. Look at Auto Home. Okay, here's a breakout. It's breaking out. What happens? It fails. And it finds support at the 65-day exponential, and at the same time, it's undercutting this low, and it rallies above it. So as soon as it comes back above that low, you can go long. And it takes its time, but notice how it settles along the 20-day line. Volume dries up a little bit in a lot right here, actually. So it's actually voodoo levels, and then you move higher and it has continued to move higher. But you see these buy points at work, and you can also see time and time again that if you're buying the breakouts, you're probably getting blown out relatively quickly, or at least you're not feeling good right away. You know, And the essence of trading to me, what makes it fun, is to get some positive reinforcement from your methods. You know, And when you're buying breakouts like a fool and you're getting slapped around, I just don't understand how anybody can continue to do it. And every day I get these emails from... Uh, IBD telling me, oh, this stock is reaching a buy point at uh, such and such a price, and it's usually way up there. Now, here we go again. Uh, I'm watching the video gamers because there is going to be another cycle coming into play here. So a lot of these have been beaten to a pulp. And this one, kind of hard to see, I guess, but I think you guys can see this one. Raise your hand if you can't. Uh, you undercut this low and you move higher. So an undercut and rally move. Notice how the strength here doesn't lead anywhere. Uh, and you wait, you just lay back and you'll see an undercut and rally. You also had one in here, but I don't really define that so much as an undercut and rally move. This is better. You know, where you get to a point where if if people view this as support and it looks like it's breaking support, a lot of times you'll get the undercut and rally move. So how are we doing on time, George? Keep going. You've got Got as much time as you want. But what I want to do here is I basically just want to demonstrate that my sample size, which I'm just pulling off of my current long watch list, I can go through many, many more, and I have spreadsheets filled with them, literally hundreds and hundreds of examples over the last few years. Uh, so I don't need to make up baloney that I read out of a book that's uh, dated at this point. I, I can see what's happening in real time. And I, I urge everyone to do that. I think uh, you know you could probably, using Chris White's product, Edge Raider, I'm sure you could test, and Chris can can uh, attest to this or not, I'm sure you could test the undercut and rally setup. And then you maybe even be able to uh, refine it, you know, with the type of stock, you know, what are the fundamental characteristics, is there anything relevant there, um, you know, the slope of the uptrend, or, or was there a bigger prior downtrend? I'm sure you could test a lot of different stuff. I don't really do that. I'm not necessarily a system trader. I have my basic setups, and I operate... Uh, on the basis of that, because I can see what's happening. You know, if you think about it, everything is derived from price and volume. So things like MACD and accumulation distribution and relative strength and all these indicators, uh, Bollinger Bands, whatever, they're all derived from price and volume. So ultimately, that's the source. Now, let's see, Alteric, similar sort of thing. Here's an undercut and rally here. Boom. Looks like garbage. Heavy selling, right? Down big on volume, buy signal. Another one. More recently, uh, Boeing's uh, undercut these lows along the 200-day line. It's got all this bad news. I notice it's hanging in there pretty well, so it may be ready to charge out of there. And you did have a uh, – I like the way Ron set this up for me. You have a pocket pivot here along the 10-day line. I don't know if it closed above it, but Ron Brown created this uh, 
visual indicator of five and ten day pocket pivots, which is really useful. I tend to be very visual with my charts, so I'm going through a lot of charts all the time, and if I can see a pocket pivot simply by the blue coating, and Ron Brown created this, and this is my actually my uh, secret weapon chart, bar chart setup that is available on HGSI, HGS Investor. And George, that is my, it's basically my main squeeze, my weapon of choice. Mm -hmm. MarketSmith is nice. It's kind of quaint, you know. They send you alerts when you're supposed to add to stocks 2% higher, all kind of dumb stuff like that. Um, Alibaba. If you notice, if you go back on some of these, uh, the Chinese names, some of these were posting undercut and rally moves down in here. This one was a couple times. It didn't here. But I also will use, another thing is uh, to use these bingo bars, these oversold bars. This is an uh, indicator that Ian Woodward created. It can also be useful after you see three distinct groupings of these, uh, and that coincides with the macro undercut and rally. So uh, you see Baozun did the same thing down along here, undercut and rally along these lows in here. Probably should get my uh, crosshair up. You can see that. <clears throat> it takes a little bit of time, though, to get going. The Chinese names seem uh, to be very much a mixed bag. I'm not really enamored with any of them, really. They're slow and they're erratic. They start acting well and then they break down. Now here's canopy growth. This is a nice undercut and rally down here along the lows when the market turned. And this is one I discussed in my reports. And it had a very sharp move. Notice how after the undercut and rally, that was your move. That was your high velocity, high time value trade right here. And then since then, what has it done? Well, not very much. But more recently, you had one undercut and rally here and that failed. Okay, so. You had a second one occurred here, and it took a little while to get going, but that actually worked. I actually thought this was a short on this day. It's moving higher. Uh, but they, uh, I think they're buying a New York-based grower, so I, I suppose that implies then that uh, the U.S. will soon be legalizing cannabis on a federal level, which I think would be smart. Um, I, mean, I could pontificate on that a lot, but being a minority, I'm Mexican-American, uh, you know, you t they talk a lot about in the U.S. about uh, African Americans being victims of uh, police, so-called police brutality. But I, I think the police aren't out to get African Americans any more than they're out to get Mexican Americans. Although they tend to be the ones that get shot the most relative to their uh, ethnic group size. I think it's the laws, and I, and mostly uh, these groups, these ethnic groups, have run-ins with the law because they're breaking drug laws. And if you go back to the congressional record back in the 1930s, drug laws against marijuana and, and other drugs were created specifically, and the language is right there, the Congress, uh, the, the members of Congress who are debating this legislation, it was all used to keep the Mexicans and the blacks, or the, as they refer to them, the Negroes, in check. And so, you know, I think you would solve a lot of problems, and that's why I'm in favor of uh, legalizing marijuana and probably legalizing most drugs. But anyways, so I think the whole trend is a good thing. And from an investment perspective, I think people are waking up to this. And uh, I definitely push the argument and coming from my own experience, because I know friends of mine who ended up in jail, it was because they had a bag of weed, you know, and, and that was a very, to me, that's a very uh, silly thing to arrest someone for. Um, anyways, and I think that's the root cause of what they call police brutality against minorities. So I don't know what it's like in Canada, but I can tell you what it's like in the U.S. And I come from that background. So, uh, anyways, here's a Sienna Corp. This is uh, recently an undercut and rally here, but it's not really going anywhere. But let's just uh, plow through. You can see some undercut and rallies in here, a few, but mostly bouncing off the 65 day. So again, it's these themes. The undercut and rally setup, both that and the moving average setup, and also the macro undercut and rally that you can see on the weekly chart that often coincides with the market bottoming and turning, even whether it's a, a deep correction where they all start calling it a bear market correction right at the bottom, or even a 7 to 10% intermediate correction. You'll see these patterns coincide with the market. So Cree is another similar situation. Um, yeah, and you'll see undercut and rally moves in here. You see one in here on Salesforce here, undercuts this low, turns and rallies. Didn't quite make it to this low, but you notice that it does tend to find support along the 65-day exponential moving average. So you really do have to put the puzzle pieces together to some extent. You know, But the undercut and rally, when you see it, is very, very clear. CSX, I just got that. I'm just going through these. 
Um, and you see a, a pretty severe one here. Uh, Decker's had an undercut and rally here through these lows. Disney, that's just the viable gap up. But you might notice something down here. You undercut all these lows, volume is heavy, and it turned and rallied out of there, and it's going higher. I'm actually surprised that it's moving that sharply. Here's another one, DocuSign. Right here, undercut those these lows here on this day, and it's gone higher. Now it's back at the highs. So again, there's another example. I want to go through this a little faster. eBay, you can see the undercut and rally off the 65-day exponential, and you see the prior low in here, and there it is. And now it's breaking out, or trying to. I'm not sure. Let's see. This low here is uh, 62.03, and let's see if this low here is... Uh, 62.21, so it did not really undercut and rally this low through the low, but it did undercut and rally through these. But you also had the bounce off the 65-day exponential. And again, why does this work? I find it works the best when it's below the 50-day, because they can drop things below the 50-day, which everybody uses, or is commonly used. i got to think some people are getting smart, smarter about this. I know I'm trying to, so, <clears throat> and hopefully you all will as well. Facebook. Down big on volume here, but what are you doing? You're undercutting these lows, undercut and rally. Boom, there you go. You might also notice you had a macro undercut and rally here, and that was that coincided with the market low on Christmas Eve. Mere coincidence? I think not. <laughs> so, I mean, you guys can see it's there to see. Am I right? It's there. You know, you look at the charts, it's there. And you can't deny it. And you can also see that buying breakouts is a less effective way to buy stocks. So forget that, you know. Um, and I recently had to block my emails from IBD because the stuff they tell you is just stupidity. But it, you got to remember this. And I don't mean this to denigrate anybody. But I worked there. And I worked for the institutional side of the business, William O'Neill and Company, Inc. Investors Daily was a sister company. They were downstairs. But I got to know a lot of people down there. And the bottom line is if anybody was really any good at the market, Bill brought them upstairs to either run money or to work on the institutional side because that was the cash cow of the whole firm, of the whole complex. And we had over 700 institutional clients when I was there. That was our heyday. And the people who work for IBD are generally low-paid writers, and all they're doing is parroting O'Neill's book. They don't really have any practical experience, and they don't do any of their own original research. So you know, be wary of this stuff. And uh, my guess is they'll be out of business soon, but I don't know. I don't wish that upon them, but I, I just think that's where they're headed because it's an inflexible system, and you've created a newspaper that is centered around an inflexible system that really doesn't want to evolve. And they keep saying the same things over and over again, and people keep getting chopped up. So some people actually get offended by that, you know, but it's just reality. Uh, and that's what I'm about, trading reality. GW Pharma, okay. Uh, Ta-da, there's the undercut and rally. Even test the 65-day once and back up to the highs. So earnings come out, though, in a week. One thing I love about HGSI is they put the earnings date right here, earnings due date, and that uh, makes it easy to see when earnings are coming up. So what I'll actually do, okay, if this is my buy list, I can sort it by uh, earnings due date, and I just start with the ones that have already reported earnings. So, you know, that works. So let's if we did that, you know, Snap is done. And you can see the breakout in here is, is toast. Twitter is a Bible gap up, but you're going to see, you're going to notice in here that you have an undercut and rally here. And it took off from there. So I, I think this is Bible. I actually own the stock right now. We'll see what happens. I hope someone buys them out. Uh, Atlassian, okay, down big on volume. But you undercut this low and you're rallying back above it. That's this low here. And I believe, I'm going to have to check this, if this low is uh, 100.25, what is this? This may not be a 100, yeah, 100.51 here. Yeah, so you undercut this low here and you've rallied above it. But you can reference uh, this low probably is a little more, a little cleaner. And But you'll notice another thing here, and this is the reality of this that you have to take into account, is that they won't always work. So you notice it rallies above this low, but it fails. So you would be out, but the next day it does come in a little bit, and after it comes in, rather, it turns around, and you get another shot at it. So you may have to do it one or two times, sometimes more. I think the most I ever did one was five times with sail. Sail point, S-A-I-L is the symbol. 
Um, here's World Wrestling. This one's interesting. Um, but again, look at the support along the 65-day exponential. Now you have to ask yourself, it, it totally busted uh, after earnings. Now this is the breakout. This is the breakout. I got the email from IBD that day. So you want to be buying it, and then you want to be adding here, you know. And then you get clocked on this day when they come out with earnings. But what do you notice here? Number one, <coughs> down big on volume, okay? And you're undercutting these lows. So you're hitting the 200-day uh, simple moving average here. So this might be one to watch. If you like to swing trade, I think this could have a nice pop back up towards the 50-day. Or maybe it recovers, you know. I'm not sure. I'll have to take a quick look at the earnings on this <coughs> one. So I'm trying to give you guys also some actionable ideas. But I guess they came in with a loss. But, you know, they're going to slow down this year. And in 2020, I, estimates are showing 165% growth at 310. So that, you know, that may come into play after you get this breakdown. Because it's had a slow move higher. And you'll notice that the, the actual buy points, you know, are on the undercut and rally moves here, uh, in here. The breakout's not so effective again. You see that? And it's just time and time again. It's almost like... They're using these breakouts to suck people in, then run them out, take their stock, and then run it higher. I mean, if you're, I guess, if you're cynical and prone to uh, conspiracy theories, you know, the charts seem to show that. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know if I'm losing it. The older I get, I mean, some may argue I am, but uh, here's Boeing again. Facebook again, we talked about that. Norfolk Southern. Um, these are just the rails, and I'm puzzled as to why these rails are running higher. Uh, Service now. This is an undercut and rally here. It's roughly held that on the way up. And now you have a Bible gap up, so it's trying to move higher. The whole cloud group's been moving this past week. Um, now, Xilinx, okay. Xilinx got clocked after earnings. And again, this is uh, here's the actual buy point. You have a Bible gap up. It moves slowly, slowly higher. Holds a 20-day on pullbacks. You do get a couple of undercut undercuts of the 20-day here and briefly here. And... You now are broken down, and you're down big on volume. So I got to tell you, one of my biggest buy screens that I use now is down big on volume. In the old days, down big on volume would be a screen that I used to find short sale candidates. Now what I do is I use that to find long candidates. Another contradiction in terms, but it's the way the market works. So you take this low right here. What is that low? That low is... 116.57. What did you do on uh, Friday? You closed uh, at one. Uh, well, it's right up here. 118.93. So you're about less than two percent above this prior low. So what do you have going on here? A potential undercut and rally setup. Maybe it turns back to the upside. You had pretty decent volume on the buy side on Friday, and you basically shake a bunch of people out on the earnings report. But, you know, I hear Xilinx is going to be a big player in 5G. So, you know, this could set up a buying opportunity. And, you know, this is entirely contradictory <laughs> to the type of stuff that O'Neill teaches you, which is that, you know, you don't, you don't buy when things are down. Well, in this market, you do. And that's the way it is. And I don't know how long it continues for. My, my theory, in fact, my wife and I were talking about this last time we were out to dinner. And she says, well, when do you think things will change? And I, and I think it won't change until you just have a complete flushing out of the system and a true normalization of interest rates. So, I mean, I think there's something paradoxically Orwellian about Trump complaining about the Fed being hawkish when rates are two and a quarter percent, yet, yet at the same time telling us that we have the uh, biggest booming economy in history, which is an outright lie. But, you know, when you're a politician, which he is now, the truth is something that can be bent to your will. In any case, here's an undercut and rally in UNP. You can see that. And right off the 65-day line. So you all want to go home and put uh, the 65-day exponential on your uh, charts. And it's one, I think, to keep an eye on. Now, here's Netflix. Now, I did get an uh, email from IBD that this is the buy point, 179.09. See, there it is. It clears uh -huh. the buy point, the so-called buy point. And what happens? It immediately comes in. But where is your entry on this? Certainly not the not this day, but you can buy it at the 20-day exponential, and it works. So you might also note that on this day, Netflix undercut this low and turned right back up. And even after, let's say you had even bought this and decided you're going to be a hero and hold through earnings, even after the reversal, which was this day, after earnings, the stock held above 
that prior low. So even on this day here, it held above this low. So you theoretically, and also notice the support along the 65-day exponential line. That's the black line. And it turns and goes higher. So you see how the tactics work here and what you have to be attuned to? Uh, and it's entirely you know, out of the way, at least for myself, it took me a while to retrain myself because it's very hard for me to look at these things that way and, and see what's really happening because it's right there in front of you. But it's very hard to change your psychology. And when you've created an entire newspaper built around looking at breakouts as buy points, well, you know what that means. So as we cruise through all of these, MongoDB, okay, what do we have here? Undercut and rally, it bounces off the 50-day line. Now we're holding tight along the 20-day line, the 10-day line as volume declines. That's a pretty typical setup, probably viable. It's probably going to head higher. They come out with earnings at the beginning of June. So that's one I'd be more interested in playing. So what I do is I sort my list on HGSI by the earnings due date, which I showed you up here. And I have the, uh, the furthest out at the top. And so as I go down, you can see, hopefully you guys can see this. Is my screen really big over there, George? Is it like 50 feet across? Yeah, and there, we've got more than 1,000 people in the room right now. Okay, so. now at the end of my presentation, I want you to cue the pyrotechnics that I sent you, okay? The fireworks? Yeah, got it. The, the Michael Jackson flamethrower. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, so so you can do this really easily. And uh, and I look at, and every day I'm looking at my charts and the things that might be actionable. I'm mostly focusing on stocks that either have already reported earnings or uh, aren't going to be reporting for at least two to three weeks, hoping I can get a trade. Like Okta is a good example. Here you have one breakout. Whoa, what happened there? <coughs> got pregnant. My line got pregnant there. You have one breakout, and it fails on heavy volume, heavy volume, but it holds along the 20-day and the 50-day, turns around and re-breaks out. But that gets a little extended, and then it comes in hard, volume picks up a little bit, but we hold the 20-day exponential, and we re-break out. And then there's actually another buy point in here, and that's Jesse Livermore's century mark rule. Some of you who've been following my work for some time may know that this is one rule that I took from an example in reminiscences of a stock operator where he talks about Anaconda Copper, and he was buying the stock at like 302 as it came up through the $300 level because he had a rule that when a stock came up through a, a big round number like 100, 200, 300, what I refer to as a century mark that a stock would generally have a strong move through it. So I developed a basic rule using some examples. And I would tell you, this doesn't work as well as it used to. But when you get through like 100, that becomes a new buy point using 100 as your selling guide or your stop. And that would be, let's say if you bought shares in here, OK, or in here. And so you, you built a little position in here. Now you're up here and you add some shares on this. You can add up there, but I would use a $100 level as a selling guide for the shares purchased up above 100, not for your whole position. But that's just another way to keep risk in check, and it's another buy point. Zscaler is another one I'm watching, Amberella. Uh, and for those of you who have watched my video reports, I actually talked about Amberella down in here, mainly because the drone thing is coming back into focus. And you know these guys have terrible fundamentals, but the thematic basis for this seems to be driving the stock higher. And uh, that's worked so far. But again, notice. Uh, Notice the breakout, and it fails. But where do you hold? Say it all together, the 20-day exponential. So I'll beat this into your heads eventually. But I'm almost through here. You see an undercut and rally there. I can see Coupa we've already talked about. You see Palo Alto Networks. Where's the undercut and rally? Here. Uh, and you can also see, and this is another reality of this, so I'm not going to tell you that this is necessarily always a magical set up, but you do at least get tradable rallies because you do have an undercut and rally here and it turns back to the upside, but it heads back to the highs of the range and then it breaks down again. So, I mean, in theory, you could swing trade it and you're getting some nice moves in there, 5% uh, or so, but notice how this is really probably your better uh, entry point on an undercut and rally because it looks so ugly. The uglier, the better because your volume picks up in here, you break below the 50-day line, and you bounce off the 65-day exponential, and you undercut this low and rally back above it, and you bounce right back to the highs. They're everywhere. Are they not? <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, they're there, you know? It's just an even work day is another example. You an undercut and rally here. Notice down big on volume. What is that? Is that a sell signal? 
No, it's a buy signal because you go higher, you get the undercut and rally, there's your trigger. It might take a couple of days. Um, another instance, down big on volume, that's your low. And then you trundle back to the highs. So again, there, there's also this phenomenon you see the, the uh, escalator up, the elevator down, escalator up, elevator down, escalator up, elevator down, escalator up, elevator down. And you see that a lot. And you know, do humans do that? They, they panic and they suddenly start selling, or is it machines just hitting bids and trying to knock things down? I don't know. But you tell me. What is If we're looking at the chart evidence, what is it telling you? What can you theorize? Here's one I like, uh, mainly because you have a little undercut and rally going on through this low and this low, although that's not as major of a low as this one. And notice you've got extreme voodoo over here. You can see the volume. On the left side, minus 71.3% below average on Friday, hanging very tight along the 10-day line. I'll take this trade and use either the 50-day or the 10-day as a very tight selling guide. So that looks that's a voodoo pullback, you know. So and what do you notice? You know, you, as you undercut, you find support near the 65-day exponential moving average, and it flips just below the 50-day. Fake everyone out, and. Uh, we already talked about Deckers. This is a little, here's a little undercut and rally through this low. Not really that major. But watch those lows in the pattern. Here's another one. I like this one, actually, because you do have an undercut and rally through this low here. Notice down here you had an undercut and rally through this low. Now, you did have an undercut and rally through this low, and it failed. But if it fails, what do you do? You're just gone very close to this price point. So you keep your risk in check. So again, I want to repeat, the strategy is to take bigger positions than you would normally on a breakout. And instead of waiting six, seven, eight percent before you cut your loss, you keep your loss to the prior low. And if you want to, if you can stomach it, add another one to three percent, I guess. My own preference is to not allow for any. If I do, it might be a dime or twenty cents at the most. So but that's also because I might take a hundred percent position. So <laughs> Yeah, and that's why, you know, somebody asked me the other day, you know, can you describe how you build your positions and how you manage your positions? Like, yeah, I buy 100% positions and then peel them off as they go up. But most people can't do that. So it's not, I don't think it's sincere to pretend that you can do what I do or you can, you know, uh, achieve the same results, just be like me. You know, I think that's all BS. And it's, it's something that's sold on the Internet. I, I try to be at least realistic about it. I also insist that people be willing to do some work. Learn to do it yourself and be empowered, you know, rather than being dependent. I'm not I'm not out to create dependency, you know. Someone thinks I'm a guru. Huh. If you watch some of my mistakes, you might change your mind very quickly on that one because I screw up a lot too. So uh but here you have an undercut and rally in Waju. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Mimecast. And this is actually a classic example because it goes nowhere for a while and notice how every time it breaks it looks like it's done volume here, but you, you have an undercut and rally through these lows here, and you break out. What happens to the breakout? That's a trend line breakout, right? I can draw a trend line along the top, so you break out, and then you fail. And then what happens? Well, you blow through all these lows, but what do you do? You find support at the 65-day exponential. There it is again. And what do you do? You undercut this low and rally back above it. That's a long entry signal. Boom, back at the highs. What do you do? You sell it. It comes back in hangs along the 50-day line, now it's back at the highs. Earnings are coming up in a couple of weeks. But, I mean, this sort of pattern is not unusual for this market. And I challenge you to just pull, like, pull up, uh, like Ron and uh, Ron and Ian have that uh, list every day. Uh, it's 100 stocks, stocks up on volume. Just go through those lists and look at the patterns. And, you know, you go back a couple months, a few days, whatever, and you're going to see these patterns over and over and over again. Okay, TME coming out with earnings in a couple of weeks. So there's not much I want to do here. But what I'm noticing here is you're, you're bouncing off the 65-day exponential. You've got a couple of lows in here. Maybe you're going to come back up to those lows and trigger a UNR. If I can catch it for a trade, I might try that because this stock tends, it'll have sharp little bursts, you know. And they're usually good for 10, 15, sometimes 20% very rapidly. So high time value there. So that's one I'm keeping an eye on. Trade desk, this one's classic. Uh, undercut this low here, down big on volume. That's an undercut and rally. It turns around and back up to the highs. And now we're back at the old highs. You're breaking out here. I don't trust it. Earnings come out next week, week after this. So 
So how many more examples do I need to show you before you're convinced? And where's the support? 65 day exponential. And this is just my long watch list. I'm not I didn't create this list specifically for these examples, but I can pretty much go through any extensive list of stocks and I can find these setups all over the place. And so if you start to operate with these in mind, I think your success will uh, increase in terms of getting some some love, as I like to call it, or positive feedback after you place a trade and seeing the stock actually move up rather than buying a breakout and watching it slap you in the face like a bad date. And, uh, and you do this, I think you increase your success rate, and I also believe that you can keep your risk to a minimum when you're wrong because not all will work. Okay, and there, there is no magic setup that's right 100% of the time. I'm sure, like I said, you could run undercut and rally criteria on uh, Chris's uh, program, and it would show you that there, there are some that fail. Now, I, I haven't done a lot of detailed work, but maybe some of you using his uh, program could do some more detailed work and email me your findings. <clears throat> Nothing I love more than people doing free research for me. Anyways. Uh, but you can see, you know, it's everywhere. Here's another one. Roku is actually also an undercut and rally through this low just recently. And notice what happens. And I point this out in my report that it did undercut this low, and then you rallied back above it on this day on a gap move. Okay, So that's actually constructive. And then it holds very tight along the 20-day line as volume dries up. That's constructive. And now it's moving through the 50-day line. They come out with earnings in a week or so. So I'm not really inclined to do anything there either. Although you know you could could have caught this trade, but I don't know how much it's good for. But again, it's just demonstrating the concept. Again, you notice Weibo is uh, in position here. It's at the 200-day line, and it's just undercutting this low. And I think let's check this. The low here is 67.09. The low over here is 67.73, and you close at 67.74. Okay, so your low here is 67.73. You undercut it and you close a penny above it. So what do you have? You have an active UNR setup here, and the beauty of this is that you could use the 200-day, the 50-day, or even the 65-day, which are all sitting in uh, confluence, as I like to say. Uh, provide a reference for a selling guide. The only downside here is that you report earnings on 5A. So we're getting to the the uh, portion of my list where we're closer to, uh, we've got earnings reports that are close by. Anyways, that's all I've got. So I hope I have provided you guys with some hard evidence for some new methods that you can actually implement when trading start, opens up again on Monday and put to good use and hopefully improve your results. So Because they work and I get a lot of feedback from people and I'll admit it varies. Like I'll have some members, they cannot make a dime in the market, you know, if you handed them a trade. And I've got other guys, I had a guy email me, it's like, oh, he lives in Newport Beach, which is a very ritzy area down here. And he says, oh, yeah, I'm up 180%. I decided to buy the house next door to me. So he's got his house and that big house next to him. I don't know what he's going to do. He's going to create a compound. Anyway, so, so there's varying results. And I think some people are cut out to trade and some are not. Uh, and I run across it a lot. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that these methods are all foolproof if you're a complete moron and you have no trading aptitude. So you can lose money, uh, as everybody knows. So, I mean, it's the reality of trading, right? But, you know, that these are methods and they do, they do work. And uh, I get a lot of positive feedback from people. And, uh, and you can see that statistically in terms of the sample size, uh, they, they, it happens, and I challenge you to go look at any list. You can go through the 100 stocks that uh, is Ian and Ron's. Uh, I, mean, I know Ian has passed away, but he still lives on HGSI, which is kind of cool. Uh, he's a mentor to me, so I, I definitely looked up to him. Very smart guy, a very wise person, and very, very, uh, shall I say, he seemed, he seemed a lot more caring than like Bill O'Neill. Bill O'Neill is in a lot of ways a very cold person so but there's a difference in personalities but in any case that's all I've got any questions oh can I just ask one quick question Gil can you can you talk a little bit about the Gilmo report and oh the Gilmo report well I guess, I guess I can I mean you can go onto the website it's just gilmoreport.com it's you get the basic report is 49.95 a month and there's a quarterly plan that's a little bit cheaper 
So I don't, you know, I don't have this baloney where I noticed there are websites that, out there where they're charging $999, $199, $399 a month. I don't know who's that stupid to pay that much, but I really don't think that that's what uh, the it should really be all about. Okay, first of all, I think if you're such a great trader, why do you need to to gouge people on a website? So my objective here is just to create something that will teach people some methods and encourage people to empower themselves, not to encourage dependence on me. And I admit some people will subscribe for fears and then they'll eventually leave because they've acquired what they need to acquire, and that's the whole point of it all. And so I keep it low price, but more recently, uh, you know, the, the costs of running a website keep increasing. And I kept the price at forty nine ninety five for the report for over ten years. And more recently, uh, you know, our, our server costs. We had to go to a bigger server, and everything is costing more. Our our payments processor is charging us more. And so my people are saying, you know, we got to you got to raise the price. And I thought, well, I don't want to raise the price on the basic report. So what I did is I've added a couple of things. I have a blog page where I will post trading ideas. When I see them, I don't spew stuff all the time. If you want me to spew at you, go on my Twitter page. I'll spew at you all day long. But on my blog page, I try to be a little bit more selective about my ideas. And then I also put out video reports two, three times a week that are pretty short. I try to keep them short. Uh, but as you may have noticed, I have the gift of gab, so sometimes I can uh, – ramble on, but I try, I've been trying to get better about that, but I try to keep it to anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes, and basically dealing with what I might be seeing, some themes that might be fleshing out in the market, trading ideas, and I think that's an, an additional 19.95 or 29.95 a month. But my view is this, if you subscribe to a website, any website, and it doesn't pay for itself, then you shouldn't be subscribing to it. End of story. And if people are putting out websites where there's either too much stuff that confuses you. Like I see some websites, they've got a chat room, they've got a live trading room. Now, I don't know how a live trading room works. Because if you sat here and watched me trade, you'd think I was a madman, and you would not be able to make sense of most of what I do. And I don't know how that works. They have options data, and some people think that because if you see huge interest in options and calls in the stock, that's a bullish sign. But if you guys know who Bernie Schaefer is, he wrote the book... Uh, the option advisor, and he runs that service. Bernie's actually of the mind that when you see a high call interest, an abnormally high call interest in a stock, that's bullish sentiment, and hence on a contrarian basis, is bearish. But yeah, you'll see a lot of sites that pitch this uh, idea that uh, you know we have uh, option data, and the more options people are buying, more calls, the more bullish it is. But some people may view that as contrarian. So there's a lot of stuff I think it confuses you. So I try to keep it simple. Um, so, I, you know, I am trying to think through this, not just random. I'm trying to understand who my reader is. I'm more concerned about the guy who's got $10,000 or $15,000 and can't afford a lot of stuff. And so I'm trying to cater to that and trying to teach people. So that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, virtuous Selfish Investing I do with my partner, Chris Catcher. These days, Chris is more into uh, cryptocurrencies, but, you know, we will – collaborate on some stuff, but uh, I'm, my focus is mostly on Gilmore Report, I have to, I'd have to say. Although, you know, when we both agree on something, uh, it may have more weight than it's just one of us. You know, unless, if we're both wrong on something, then maybe it's a lot worse. I don't know. But either one can be tried out. I know Virtuous Selfish Investing has a two-week trial for 29 bucks, And then if you don't like it, it you just cancel it. Um, so that's relatively risk-free. Anyways, but I'm I'm not all that comfortable pitching my websites. I think they sell themselves, and you won't see any uh, testimonials. Although I do keep a file of them on email emails that I get, just because I like seeing what kind of feedback I get from people and whether that's useful in terms of me being able to better figure out what it is people need to uh, to read, what they need to understand, and also whether they're actually understanding what I'm saying. So, anyways, and that's basically my approach to the websites. That's all. Any other questions? Um, somebody just asked about you scanning to identify undercut and rallies. So well, I here's what I'm doing basically with an undercut and rally. You'll notice that what I went through is my long watch list, right? So I'm scanning that. Now, the other thing I'm also looking at, so I'm basically just going through those charts. I also like to look at other lists. For example, if you look at uh, Ian and Ron's list that comes out every day, stocks up on volume. I don't look at the one that stocks under $8 or whatever that is, but I look at that one every day. And that's 100 stocks. And I'm just looking at them and eyeballing them, looking for undercut and rallies. Now, I don't know how 
exactly how you would set a screen up for that, but someone who's more sophisticated with that, like Ron or maybe even Chris, could understand how to test something like that on his program. They might have a better idea how you actually screen for undercut and rallies, but I find it more of a visual thing. Now, the other thing, I'll create a list of stocks down big on volume. Okay. So anytime I see stocks big on volume, I'm always pulling up the charts to see what, un what prior lows in the pattern they might be undercutting. So that's really how I'm doing. I'm going through lists of stocks. The only screen I would say that I use is either a new low screen, a new 52-week low, or just down big on volume. But that doesn't always show them to you. Usually they'll happen in leading stocks as they're trending higher, but they'll form a base, as I showed you many of these, uh, the way they do that. They form a base, and then they'll undercut the lows of the base, looking like they're breaking support, but in fact they're just undercutting the prior low. And as soon as they rally back above that exact low, that's your long trigger point. So that's how that's done. There are no specific screens for an undercut and rally. If I ever figure out how to do it, you know, we'll just put it up on uh, HCSI or something like that. I don't know. Right. Well, if um, if you've been looking at Chris during your presentation, you can see the wheels in his head are turning, and mm -hmm. he's got a big smile on his face. So he, he's always looking for ideas, and I think you're going to probably see an undercut and rally template. <laughs> in the next few months from Chris. Yeah, I think that would be useful, you know. I mean, he might even get me to use his product. <laughs> I mean, I, and I, I, Chris puts out a good product, okay? He's a very smart guy. Right. But well, I've just I, never, I've never really been oriented that way. I'm not really a system guy. And so right. I just, my method is to just look at as many charts as possible. And like I said, for me, charts are like porn. I just look at them all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and my wife isn't really sure to be dis whether she should be disturbed by that or not. Like, would I be more normal if I was looking at porn? So I don't know. <laughs> okay. Anyway. And anybody here have any questions? Dan's got a question. Um, yeah, I've got a question. So with all of the, um, uh, you know, these rallies and they get sold off and um, the, the, the chopping that's happening, um, do you think that the VIX would be increasing, but it's not? It just keeps getting lower. We keep going to all time lows. And the volatility I think the VIX is manipulated. Uh, How's that? I mean, I don't look at it, so I don't pay any attention to it. I know, I mean, I, I'll give you one example. My partner, Dr. Chris Ketcher, he tried to develop a VIX volatility model where he's trying to time the VIX. And that was just a colossal failure. I mean, he'd come up with back tests, and the back tests look really great. But what he was noticing is that it, there's nothing uniform about it. So what you're pointing out is that there, there is, it doesn't seem to correlate to what you're seeing with some of the volatility in individual stocks. It doesn't seem to correlate to that. But if you look at the indexes, the uh, the, the indexes demonstrate very little volatility because I think for the last month or so, there hasn't really been a 1% move in the indexes. I think maybe the NASDAQ had the first one a few days ago. But it, it, there is not a lot of intraday volatility. In fact, they found, I saw one study that showed that uh, for 17 out of 18 days, the S&P, uh, most of its movement occurred in the futures overnight. And then during the day, all it was doing was consolidating the overnight gains. And that strikes me as a manipulation as well. So, because futures volume, liquidity in futures has been drying up. So there's less and less liquidity in futures than there was in the past. And so I think that can be manipulated a lot too. So, you know, all that's to say, VIX futures might be manipulated. And I've read some articles, you know, some conspiracy theory, theory articles that the VIX has been manipulated or is actively being manipulated. And that may be true. And also it, it corrobor it's corroborated by the experience that Chris, my, my partner Chris Ketcher had, trying to create a VIX volatility model and finding out that the data was not uniform and you couldn't really draw conclusions from what you saw during one short period of time versus another. And so there was no way to really come up with consistent signals that worked. And it really was a disaster. It really was. Um, so we discontinued that service on our website. And I think that's all related to the same thing, uh, the root cause of which is that the drivers of the market are machines mostly, and you have to think like an algo if you're going to succeed. Okay, just got a question here. <laughs> Do you think the undercut and rally approach is more relevant now since we're in a 10 plus year bull market? I think you've already answered that. But... I, I think it is much more relevant. And uh, I mean, I used to use, if you go and read the book on short selling that I wrote, I actually wrote that book 
uh, Dr. Ketch, he just uh, proofread it mostly, but because I'm the only one who shorts between the two of us. But I used to use the undercut and rally as a short-term cover signal. So when I, if I was shorting something, it's coming down, coming down, and finally undercuts the low. You know, like let's say I got short this thing at the 200-day line, and it cuts, comes down here and undercuts this low. I might cover, and then look to re-enter in here uh, as it moves into the 20-day line or somewhere else, and then it breaks down to a lower low again. And I might cover again and then look to re-enter somewhere. And I would be stopped out if I tried to short it at any of these moving averages. But what I began to notice is that the undercut and rally did not just produce a short rally that would allow me to, to re-short a stock. It would actually lead to a big high velocity move to the upside. And you'll see here, when you undercut and rally here through these two lows, you see the velocity. And you'll see that a lot in these. So I began to just observe that there was a different sort of action. And this started... I, I quit running money for others, which I admit is probably the biggest mistake of my life. And for me, as a, I was a colossal failure at it because I just cannot handle people calling me up all the time wondering how we're doing this week or how we're doing that. I mean, because like I said, I can draw down 20%, 30% in a hurry, and that's normal to me. And I don't freak out, but someone I'm running money for could see that and freak out. So I couldn't do that. So I stopped running money. Uh, I actually had to have an operation to remove a, a benign tumor from my prostate back in 2013, and I had a revelation while I was in the hospital. I'm sure everybody has this. Angels came out from the sky, sunlight came flying into the room, and they said to me, you need to stop running OPM, and that the market has changed, and you need to discover the secrets of the market. And it was at that point, that was in August of 2013, that I suddenly... I got back from the hospital and I called up uh, my partners and uh, said, We're, oh, this is it, no more running money, shutting it all down. And I started running my own money again using the new methods that I had uh, achieved. And I was down 32% at that point in August, just flailing. And I ended up like 55, so I was able to turn things around. And that's when I started with using these methods. But the undercut and rally uh, has worked for at least the last five, six years when I started using it. But I noticed it seems to happen with more frequency. And, and this rally that we've had uh, since the end of December, Christmas Eve, is really bizarre. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys agree with me or not, or if that's your own experience, but the, the action at times is very bizarre. And, and that's what I'm talking about when you see these big breaks on volume. It's usually just exhausting you know, the stock on the downside, and then the machines just come in and Everything turns back to the upside, you know. And is that institutional money managers with their big portfolios bailing out everything in four days and then flying back in everything over the next four? Knowing how these guys work, these and gals, a lot of women who are in the institutional money management business as well, uh, knowing how they work, they don't, they can't do that in just a few days. They tend to be slower animals, and so something is doing this very rapidly. And my, like I said, my theory is that it's machines, and, and that's why, and, and they become more a function uh, or a force in this market. And it may be similar to, you know, the trusts and the pools of Livermore's Day and Wyckoff's Day, where they manipulate the markets quite a bit, because you do see, it does seem like there's a lot of manipulation. I know Ron Brown has even mentioned that the markets seem to be subject to uh, a lot of manipulation these days. So, but there's ways to fight against it, and, and what I'm advocating here is one way. Now... It may change, so I would say stay tuned because if I see something change, I will adjust my methods. I'm always moving with the market, you know. If if the evidence is there to be seen, and I and I think my my motto is adapt or die. And in these markets, you have to figure out well how the market is working, and you have to go with it. So that's that. And I think one of the workshops that you attended in Orange County, the Southern Cal workshops, you talked about market context. And I think that yeah. was a really valuable insight that you provided for the people that were there. Yeah, I mean, you have to sit around, you know, I guess now if you're in Canada, you guys can smoke weed all you want and, you know, just kind of ponder things, you know, <laughs> <laughs> if you can. Uh, I don't really find that works for me. I, martinis work best for me, but it, that's another story. Anyways, uh, you know, just sit back and kind of look at things and, and ponder theories, you know. And so you develop theories about what you're seeing, and then you go in and you look at the charts, and there's a hard evidence there. So my theory, as I as found it right in this presentation, is that machines are driving the market, and it's more of reversion to the mean contrarian type stuff, which is typical of how I understand many machines to be programmed, knowing people who do some of this, not a lot. 
and I wouldn't say it's a big enough sample size to draw firm conclusions, but I just have an inkling of this. So it's a theory, and I think that the evidence on the charts is the proof. So, and, and we also know that, like with Einstein, the theory of relativity is incomplete, but it definitely allows, allows us to make certain predictions that are useful in terms of getting to the moon and you know, doing other technologies. So what happens here is I have a theory. It seems to prove out on the charts. I can develop practical methods, and those pr produce useful results. So it's the same concept. And I think as a trader, you want to be doing that all the time. So I think it's useful to have. I like HDS Investor. I think it's a much more flexible tool than MarketSmith, which they've done a good job with MarketSmith, but I, it's, it just doesn't cut it in terms of what I want to do. And I, I think probably Chris's product is another tool that allows you to see what's going on in the market and how things are working. So, And I'm not just pitching that for Chris. So. I'm just telling you, I think it's a reasonable to, I checked it out, and I think for that sort of thing, it's useful. Well, well Chris, is, I know, is one of your biggest fans, and whenever he sees you <laughs> doing something like you've done today, I mean, his, 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 he just lights up like a Christmas tree. So. Well, that's good. I'd like to see that. Take a picture of it and email it to me. So, <laughs> But, I mean, it's, just a, it's a tool that can be used, you know, and, and I think what, what has become more relevant today and probably more than at any time is that the market's changing, and it may continue to change and shift, because I don't know where we're going to be in a year or two from now. You know, Maybe the whole financial system collapses, and we do flush everything out. Like I was telling you, I told my wife, she's, she asked me, when do you think this is all going to end, and it's going to go back to normal. And I don't know if there ever was a normal. I think there are different periods where there are different drivers, You know, like the phenomenon after World War II, where stock ownership, equity ownership uh, as a percentage of household assets was at a, at a low and it steadily increased. You had the baby boomers as a phenomenon. I know people born in my year, 1959, uh, yeah, I have a hard time believing I'm about to turn 60 years old because I sure as hell don't feel like it. And most people will agree I don't act like it. But uh, in my, 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 the group of people born in 1959 in the U.S. are the largest cohort group in, in the history of the country. So where where we're at, and it gives me some sense of you know where people are at who are my age, and not, a lot of them are not necessarily investing aggressively. Uh, a lot of them got hurt in 2000 and 2008. I don't sense that the millennials are really a big force in terms of retirement savings. They may be more interested in cryptocurrencies or maybe not even into the markets at all. So I think that driver has disappeared. So I think we we also have to understand and think about, and this is a lot of um, you know just sort of speculating to some extent, but, you know, intelligent speculation uh, about what the drivers might be, just thinking about things and trying to identify, like I said, my conclusion is that it's machines and the, the objective evidence is on the charts, so it's at least proven there. I mean, it could be some, maybe it's Martians, but whatever it is, it's, it definitely shows up on the charts, you know. <laughs> so you think aliens may be responsible for the current market? Who knows, you know, or the it could be. I don't know. I, I gotta t tell you, in my backyard, there's this like group of pigeons. There's a group of six. They're they're actually doves. They're uh, lovey doves, I think my wife calls them. But mm -hmm. they hang out in our backyard and they sit there outside my window every day. And sometimes I I, I get the feeling that they're they're monitoring me. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And so who knows? Maybe it's the, the lovey doves uh, or whatever. But uh, I don't know. Who knows? But all, I, all you know is that the charts never lie. As someone once wisely said, there's no such thing. There may be pro forma earnings, which were very popular during the dot-com boom, if you recall. They, nobody reported real earnings, but they had pro forma results, right? There, there, are, there is no pro forma charts, or there are no pro forma charts. What you see in the chart is what's there, no matter how bizarre it looks. So at least we can rely on that simple truth. Mm -hmm. I've got one last question here, and then we'll let okay places to go, people to see. So, William, yeah, I just sit at home looking at charts all day. So, <laughs> so William's thanking you for an excellent presentation. When you get a successful entry for another rally, what is your sell rule for your payout? So William's asking when you, once you've entered a successful undercut and rally, what is your exit and sell rules? I I would have to say that there's nothing mechanical about it. I can give you an example. Let's do one example here of how I would.
would handle something. Okay, so here's Roku. Remember, this was the undercut and rally from the low um, way back here, which is at uh, – look how long ago that was. That was at uh, 29 even. So I saw that low, and you had the undercut and rally here. So you get long, pretty good size here at like 29.30. It doesn't go anywhere for several days. And then finally, boom, you get a viable gap up. But I'm not really buying that. I'll actually, because you're coming up into resistance, I'll actually sell some of that into it, if, or maybe the whole position. And then I watch for a re-entry. So what do you get in here? You, you're pulling in, you're hanging along here, you get a voodoo day, a voodoo entry day here where you're, oh, what the heck happened there? My theory is, see, that's the Martians. They're adjusting my pen size. But here's, let's see, where were we? Here's an extremely low volume day. You can see that bar is very low. And you're just hanging in here very tight, and I might come back and enter there. And so I might come back or take back some more of my position because a lot of times you might get a move up and it'll do this. So I want to prepare, be prepared to have some money in my pocket because let's face it, if you bought in at 29.30, you're up to 45 in a hurry. So what kind of a move is it? That's a 50% move in like how many days? A, a week? A week and a half? Okay. So the time velocity or the, the price velocity – equates to high time value for the trade. So you're getting a lot of bang for your buck at that point. And uh, you know you have to remember that a fool and his money are lucky to get together uh, in the first place, right? Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll just bail, you know, because I don't – I'm not uh, a guru. I, don't, I can't see the future. All I know is I got a big gain very fast, and I'll take at least part of it. And I find that usually that tends to work because you ran into some resistance along this high over here. And, you know, it's, it corroborates with other things that you can put together. It's running into resistance along the, what, 65-day exponential moving average. So you could take a profit and then wait and see if it sets up. And get, if it gets into a low-risk entry, then I can maybe try and take some of it back because it is telling you. You know, when you only see these two days on the chart, you don't see all this, okay? It is telling you that, it's running into some selling in here, okay, because it's churning around. So that that tells you, okay, maybe I do want to back away and take some profits. But then after that, it sets up again. So that's constructive. So it is telling you at that point, once you have more days of information, that it's setting up again, and you can maybe take some of those shares back uh, and rebuild the position again and then part hopefully participate in that. But I can remember there was a couple. There's a nice little undercut and rally in here. Uh, but then I think this is earnings, and so I, I won't hold in earnings, so I would probably sell it here. And uh, and then once it does this, you could, you'll could you notice that this bar shows the opening price here. So that was a buyable gap up. You could have acted on that in the morning. It would have been up very nicely by the close, and then finally it runs into resistance. But I can see that if I – let's do, a, do another chart over here. And I'll – use my uh, weekly chart, You can all, I can also see that as we're getting up near these highs, and I actually wrote about this, and you, I think I also put it up on my Twitter page, but as we're getting up from here to here, okay, this is the opposite of a rally. So I'm putting, again, putting puzzle pieces together. This is now, this rally looks like that on the weekly chart. So what am I knowing, what do I know at this point? Well, you're almost near the highs, and this looks very much like what I call the punch bowl of death. So you have a rapid decline followed by a rapid rise. There is very little consolidation on the weekly chart on the way up. In fact, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 weeks straight up, right? So there's no consolidation on the weekly chart. That cannot be sustained. It's too rapid. But it does make for a beautiful uh, move if, you, if you're playing it on the long side. So at that point, I can extrapolate that. The odds are not very high that it's going higher. And I did point this out on my Twitter page and said, you know, at this point, you got to be thinking about taking profits and backing away from this, and it may turn into a short sale target, which it in fact did uh, when it broke the 10 day line up here. You can see on this up here, that was a good short sale spot if you were privy to it. But again, notice how uh, down big on volume. It does, in the old days, you know, a punch bowl of death, a pod, it would just keep going down like this, you know, and just blow apart. But here, because things are different, then you get the, the escalator ride back up towards the highs, and then you break down. So, you know, that's a quick one-day wonder trade on the short side. But you see how you can – you're using this to extrapolate where you're going to sell. And initially, you get the high volume or the high velocity, high time value trade right here. 
fifty percent in a few days, that's something you really have to think about taking at least partial profits on and then waiting for further evidence to tell you when you might re-enter. And you might end up re-entering, you know, four or five percent higher than where you sold out. But as long as you capture most of this move, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Now another thing I should probably throw in real quick is that there is also what I call the reverse pod theory. And that is if you have a, a stock that had a hot run, and it's a hot stock, you know, uh, you can, then that was the same thing here because Roku came public, had a massive move to the upside, then it broke down hard. And then at this point when it turned, and I showed you guys on the daily chart where the turn was, you had a bottom fishing pocket pivot, then it held along the 50-day line, which is a, the blue 10-week line on the weekly chart. You can extrapolate that, hey, this might have a chance at forming a punch bowl, which means a rapid ascent up the right side. So the other thing working in my head at the time is you had not only this macro undercut and rally through this prior 29 low, but you also had this rapid descent that could produce a punch bowl pattern where you get a rapid ascent to the upside because they tend to mirror, they'll tend to mirror each other. And sure enough, that's what happened. So, you know, even as I'm, I'm aware of this, like midway up, so in here, wait a minute, whoops, in here, I'm aware of this potentiality when I get up here, right? So I'm, a, you know, even though I'm going to take profits, I'm aware that it could go higher, and you get a short consolidation that shows up on the daily chart, but not on the weekly chart. And you should be looking at both charts because I think weekly uh, can also be is very helpful in determining where you are in the overall picture. So uh, you know that's another way to sell things. So there are a lot of puzzle pieces, you know. But I'm telling you, if I get a high velocity move, 30, 40, 50 percent in just a few days. I'm likely to just take that. One of the more recent trades we had, and I actually put this out. I do what's called the Voodoo Report on uh, virtuous selfish investing, and it's basically whenever I have a random idea, which is very rarely. Last year, I think I had Funko at like uh, eight bucks or six and a half bucks, and it went to thirty something in, in a few weeks. But uh, Bitcoin Investment Trust, I, I called it a buy at, on around uh, somewhere down in here. And that had a, so that went from 460 to uh, what's the high here? Isn't there a way? Uh, let's see. If I draw a trend line, where's the drawing tools? Is that it right there? No. Drawing tool, annotation tools. There we go. If I draw a trend line from here to here, it tells me a 60% gain in uh, nine days. So something like that, you know, that's also high time value. So that's another guy, it's just high time value uh, movements, and you take profits into that. And then you notice how if you did that, now it's kind of bouncing around, and maybe it sets up again. But I don't have to be long it anymore because I made my quick money, got the high velocity move, and uh, and you know my theory on this is I started to see the bottom fishing pocket pivots. Okay. Um, and again, it, you know, it's all like looking at charts and trying to put things together and puzzle pieces together. Um, is that the Fed suddenly had gone from being hawkish to very dovish. And so one of the things I started noticing, if you look at this chart, what is one of the things you're noticing along these lows more recently since February started? What do you see? Can anybody answer that question? It's right there. Ron Brown's indicator, you, see, you start seeing all this blue, all these little blue bars in the volume. So there's all these little 10 and 5 and 10-day pocket pivots. And when I start to see a lot of those start to show up, and then you start to get a cluster of them in here, that's telling me something might be turning. That's another way to look for a turn. And I put this together with the idea that the Fed was becoming more hawkish, and, uh, and Bitcoin popped. And everybody hated Bitcoin. There was articles in the Wall Street Journal about how terrible Bitcoin was. And I, I'm not a Bitcoin freak or a Bitcoin hater. To me, it's another trading vehicle. If I think there's something setting up in it, there are certain thematic things that may come into play. You know, someday you could see Bitcoin go a lot higher if the dollar collapses, you know, and everybody's scrambling to get out of dollars. That's what happened in the last run-up back uh, over a year ago, right? When Bitcoin ran up, you had people in Venezuela and I think some African countries desperately trying to get out of their home currencies. And Bitcoin was the only way to go. And I just heard from a guy just a week ago or so, a guy who's a fund manager, and they are uh, they deal in renminbi. So it's a Chinese yuan. Uh, it's pronounced yuan, not yuan. yuan. You guys might know that since you're all in uh, Hong Kuver up there. Uh, but he, he was telling me that one of the things that they have to do to get out of renminbi or, or yuan the Chinese currency, they have to convert it to Bitcoin. That's really the only way they have to get out of it. 
And so they will do that. And so I think what drove this move was not only the frenzy into it, but also there it started with a movement uh, out of home currencies in Venezuela, in, uh, I forget, was it Ethiopia or some other country in Africa where you had the same situation? And you don't, these markets are not that liquid, so you don't need a huge influx of demand to create a big move. So, you know, so th these are ways to think about Bitcoin. And to me, Bitcoin is a very interesting new trading vehicle, and you have these ETFs now where you can test theories and trading systems with these. I know Dr. K uses various trading systems with Ethereum and Bitcoin and some of the other coins. I know uh, ETCG, whoops, I hate it when it makes that noise at me. Look at the Ethereum, oh, come on, it's, is it not on here? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting the ETCG. No, I guess not. What's the matter here? And I know the symbol for um, the, Ethereum. The Ethereum ETF. And I, ETCG. Yeah, I'm throwing that up there. It's just not on. Oh, no. Side. Does this mean I'm going to have to do this? Let's see. I'm trying to bring it up on MarketSmith, but it's MarketSmith is like giving birth to a cow right now. It's not moving. <laughs> How about, let's do this. Hang on, hang on. Uh, let's go. I think to you also looked at Riot, didn't you? Gil? Riot was another one uh, back back then, yeah. And I put out a report on that. But here's ETCG. That's had a nice move. Look at the move in that one. Even better. And you're going to notice that you do get some. Uh, okay, <laughs> look at this. Here's a low here. These lows in here. Do you see those? Let me get. Did someone just throw up? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like someone just threw up. So uh, but notice how you undercut that these lows in here, and then you rally. So there actually was a buy. I, I wasn't watching this one when I saw this uh, because this thing is so thin. The GBTC is much thicker uh, as a vehicle to uh, to trade. This thing trades like twenty nine thousand shares a day. I think it is. Um, wow, it looks like my uh, market smith has gone bonkers trying to figure this one out. <laughs> Seriously, I think I broke it. Yeah, because uh, the, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust trades 3 million shares a day, and this thing trades, um, what do we say it was again, ETCG? Let's see if I can get it this time. It just doesn't want to work. Look at this. Wow. Oh, well. Anyways, uh, you guys get the idea, though. So, you know, this thing trades on average. Uh, it actually should be up here. Volume. It trades 31,700 shares a day. But you see also how the undercut and rally setup can work in the currencies, okay? Because they do uh, reach oversold conditions, and they're probably less viable on uh, on that sort of a setup. But you also notice here you had a nice, uh, I think it was a pocket pivot in here somewhere. Actually, these two days in here, pocket pivots. I like uh, stockcharts.com. Uh, for people who really don't have the money to spend on charts, I think it's probably the best service out there. And I think it costs 100 bucks. A year, so I'm always I'm just throwing up again. What happened? Bad coffee. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm very acutely aware of uh, the needs of people who are just getting started, and I try to cater more to that. And I remember when I started with three thousand dollars that my grandmother left me. So, and uh, she's gone now, but I sure I'm sure she'd be very happy to see what that three thousand dollars is worth today. Anyways, so, you know, so there's, uh, I don't know how we got on this topic, but again, there's another example of high velocity trade. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. And how sometimes you just take it and you'll find, you know, in general, something especially like Bitcoin that it has a lot of overhead supply. So if you do get a sharp move, you can almost bet that you're going to run into a period of either people who got caught in the downtrend are going to be selling out. Uh, or just prop, normal profit taking, and it's happening around the 200-day line, which really is not a very good guide, and even the 20-day is not really working out right now. But it may be that um, I, I notice gold is also not really happening. And I own. Uh, see, some people will say, "Oh, well, you're a short-term investor." I just want you all to know, I own a pretty large amount of gold that I bought in year 2000, and it was trading around 280 and out, and I still have it. And so I'm a long-term investor. Me and Warren Buffett. Good buddies, but you're going to notice something in the gold more recently. What do you notice? You're getting an undercut and rally. You had one here, 
and it undercut those lows there. And you had a nice rally into the 50-day, but that didn't sustain itself. And then you broke lower. But a part of this also is because of the uh, the dollar has been rallying. So I mean, gold tends to inversely correlate with the dollar. And uh, I think if you saw if you saw gold and the dollar moving higher, that might be the uh, crisis sort of signal. Um, so, but anyways, so there is an undercut and rally currently in the GLD. Any other questions? Be careful what you ask me because I may, it may go off on a ten minute uh, diatribe. We invite you with uh, martinis and pot uh, when you come up here in person. <laughs> Uh, well, I got to tell you, when I was up there in '92 at that CEO's house, uh, you know, I did, I didn't uh, partake, but I did not inhale. So <laughs> I injected it. I, I I distilled the oil out and then I injected it in a uh, River Phoenixian speedball variation. So that was hilarious, though. I mean, I was I wasn't sure whether to be uh, shocked or excited, you know. Imagine if you're like uh, in Steve Cook's, is it, no, who is he? Tim Cook, yeah, he's the CEO of Apple. Um, if you were in his backyard and you just saw like a whole bunch of pot plants. And this was back when it was not legal. So that was pretty bold. But like I said, this guy was ahead of his time as Elon Musk. Isn't Elon Musk a Canadian? Yes. <laughs> he is. Yeah. See? Hmm, I don't know if we can draw any conclusions from that. But. Anyway, any other questions? I've... I think everybody's um, got lots of questions, but <laughs> I really appreciate the time that you've taken to to talk to the group, and um, well, I'm hoping polite. that that's that you are available to do something like this again. And you know, we'd we'd love to have you here in person, but. Sure, that's fine. Well, once my son is in college, my wife and I, like my wife was saying, gosh, we could have just flown up to, up to Vancouver. She'd like to see Vancouver, and I love the place, so I think it's awesome. What's the weather like right now? Um, well, the, the sun's out, there's totally blue sky, you can see the swallows buzzing around. Mm -hmm. um, we have a classroom here, De um, Dan has a Valley driving school, so he, he educates drivers for training, and it's actually the best classroom that we've had for all the workshops that I've done. Uh -huh. I think it's even better than the Paulus Verde Library. So. And where are you? Are you in Langley? Yeah, Dan said he'll take a picture and send it to you, and, and he'll also take a picture of um, Chris smiling when he thinks <laughs> about the you and our um, template that he's going to have on the works next. Okay, well, I'm just, you know, I'm not. I'm not trying to pitch Chris's product, but I think something I've thought about it because I never really. I never used the product. I tried it out, and I didn't really find it for me. It, it didn't. I, I couldn't make it sing for me. But I've been thinking about it more because of what's going on with the market and how things have shifted. So uh, yes, but you know, if any of you guys figure out if you find anything new, I'm. I'm actually fine doing things the way I do it, and you pretty much got the idea. I just go through a lot of charts. I have my buy list. I use that one list from uh, Ian and Ron. <coughs> Another one, if you have the time, is just do a screen on HCSI of all stocks with an ERG over 180, you know, or do a screen of all stocks with a composite O'Neill composite rating over 85 or 95, uh, and just go through that. And you, you'll have plenty of charts to look at. So, and that's really right. the key for me. So how do I unshare, stop sharing? I'm going to do that. How do you stop? I'll just um, take oh. over control again, and then I'll okay. shut, shut it down. But again, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure, absolutely. That's I mean, you guys job. can see, you know, if you sat down with me and we started drinking martinis, I, we'd probably be up all night talking about the markets. So it right. is my passion. It is my passion. I'm I'm grateful that this is all I have to do all day. In fact, I'm still sitting here in my t-shirt and sweats and it's pretty much how I trade so anyway right well it's great ha great hearing from you again and you know I was sorry when um, Ian passed away and the HESI meetings were no more and um, I'm glad that we've got an opportunity to hear from you so thanks for yeah. your coming Gil and I'll, I'll talk to you soon okay thanks George take care everyone have a, enjoy welcome. the rest of the workshop take care yeah.